Good evening and welcome back. Prime Minister, just answer all the questions posed by the members of parliament in the round one. Now we're going into clarification round and I see MP Sarah Westcott Williams has the has the floor. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you and a good night to all. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the Prime Minister for her responses and in connection with her responses, I would like to ask that the following be clarified. With respect to the NDV and the reference to the coming into being in April 2012 and what is now being done, if the Prime Minister can indicate whether the implementation mechanism as per the NDV, whether um, that is in place, it is being put in place, um, is my question pertaining to that. So the implementation mechanism as per the NDV, is that already in place? And if not, is it being in place? And what are the steps being followed for such? Mr. Chairman, with respect to the English language and my questions pertaining to elevating English to the higher level of our two languages, and the Prime Minister indicated that it is a very, very lengthy and comprehensive process um, with which I agree, of course, and I hope that the Prime Minister did not take from the motions of Parliament that it was felt that this is just something that we wake up tomorrow or next week and it would be done. So I just, I just wanted to make sure that that is not what the Prime Minister got from the motions of Parliament because that was definitely not the intention. In fact, the motions speak about a plan that would need to be prepared of the steps to be taken. And what I do... What I would want to know from the Prime Minister is whether the Prime Minister is willing and how that would be done to take at least the initial steps, a decision to that effect. Uh, yeah, what, uh, what, what are the first steps that the Prime Minister see necessary to take in order to embark on this comprehensive national plan for the English language? So is the government willing to make a decision that that will be pursued and then maybe outline the first few steps to take in that regard. Mr. Chairman, the Prime Minister referred to her answers to me with respect to electoral reform. And uh, I had mentioned my letter that was sent and I was supposed to get an answer to it regarding electoral reform because not all of the questions have been answered in my letter, from my letter on electoral reform, and very specifically the issue of Article 59, with which I wanted to dialogue with the government on the, the status of that article. Those are questions in my letter to which I referred in the first round, to which I referred again, and I would just like to know in that context if those particular questions, the questions relating to Article 59 of our Constitution, and that has to do with the dissolving of parliament. The prime minister has answered about the election, and that was a question as well. Um, but I want to know about, I want to know the feeling of the government, and I outlined in my letter why I'm asking about the feeling of the government on Article 59. I have some very specific questions where that is concerned. If the prime minister will answer those in in writing to my letter, then um, that would be okay with me as well. Mr. Chairman, coming down to the issue, coming back rather to the issue of the mutual agreement, the TWO, the responses to the questions posed by my colleague MP Emmanuel in connection with the Statement, statements made by the representative of the TWO, I would like to know from the Prime Minister in the discussions regarding coming to this mutual agreement, was any mention or reference made to the country package as a mutual agreement itself? As the Prime Minister probably knows better than anyone else, the country package mutual agreement was tied to the Koho law. 
with a coho law of the table, does that mean that there is an opening for the discussion on the country package, is my question, where that is concerned. I think, Mr. Chairman, on the next point, that the Prime Minister misunderstood my statement. I did not ask about the SDG reporting in order to be able to talk to the Dutch government. The Prime Minister said we first should talk to ourselves. My statement had to do with us being better able to represent ourselves on the matter of the SDG next to the Netherlands, sitting next to the Netherlands in the reporting of the kingdom on the SDGs. So it definitely was not that let us prepare something so that we could go talk to the, to the Dutch or whosoever. It was, it was to have to, it had to do with being better able to represent ourselves as far as the SDG reporting and monitoring is concerned. Mr. Chairman, if those, um, well, I ha those were one or two questions and then some comments on the answers given by the Prime Minister. But if the questions could be addressed, the clarifications could be addressed, then that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. The next person I see is MP Christopher Emmanuel. MP Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good night to everyone. Honorable Prime Minister, support staff, everyone in the Tribune, my colleagues, people of St. Martin, good night. Mr. Chairman, I know it's a clarification wrong. And I have just one clarification, really, for the Prime Minister, nothing to labor on on the issue. In the answers given, the Prime Minister, I believe, said that she would have a discussion with the individual of the TWO to sort of see where such article or information came from. Because it's surprising to me with the answers. But what I want to say to the Prime Minister actually is that you're the Prime Minister of this country. And if this information is not accurate or if it's not true, you also have a responsibility to the newspaper and tell them to retract it. Because you can't be the Prime Minister of a country and have other individuals making statements that is not accurate. So is it that the Prime Minister said, if that can be clarified, if she's going to have a discussion pertaining to the information in the article, because in the article it says that the 16.3 million was given directly to the government of St. Martin. That's, that's, that's what it says in the article. It says the equivalent of 16.3 million euros has been spent for the St. Martin country package up to the December 31st, 2022. The 16.3 million was either given directly to the government of St. Martin or stems from expertise that has been procured in the Netherlands. So, and that's why that's when I ask the question, what is the amount in the directly that was given? What is the amount? And what I get from the Prime Minister is sort of not really knowing the content or the heaviness of the article, and you're gonna have a discussion to find out really what's the content of it. That's all fine and well with me because I myself don't get it. I, I don't understand because it goes on with so many other different things. And what I'm saying is that you're the government. You're the government. I understand that you also said he was not given the authority from the government or anything to speak on behalf of the government. Nonetheless, this is what is out. This is what the general, general public have seen, have heard, have read. And it, it's, it's living out there. It even goes on to the 152 million hour, and after things are taken out, the 120 for the islands, for projects. What are these projects? You know, Mr. Chairman? So for me, the only thing really is if the minister is going to get this story retracted and whatever is accurate will be placed because I am confused just as much. So I don't really have no clarifications for the prime minister because 
is neither here nor there for me. However, this is what's in the papers. And if it's not coming from the government, then how reliable is the story? I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Christopher Emanuel. I see the next person is MP Rolando Bryson. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one clarification from the, for the Prime Minister. Um, I was very happy to hear in response to the question regarding the NRPB and making it sort of a long-term institution for the government, uh, more geared towards uh, executing projects on behalf of the government. I wanted some clarification in that regard because um, just to make it clear that the NRPB is already set up, from my understanding, in such a way that it can execute projects on behalf of the government, if I'm, if I'm correct. So in accordance with Article 4, um, Section B, Section A talks about the trust fund, but Section B talks about advising ministries or the departments and organizational units on the identification and implementation of recovery, reconstruction, et cetera, projects, which can be uh, financed from sources other than the reconstruction fund. So for example, they also can uh, execute projects funded by capital expenditures. Just to clarify that part, because that would be tied into one of the amendments I'll be presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. I don't see any other members of parliament asking for clarification. I will look to my right if Prime Minister is ready or would need some time to answer. Prime Minister has indicated that she would need a 10 minutes to prepare the answer, so meeting will be adjourned for 10 minutes. Meeting adjourned.
Good night and welcome back. Prime Minister is ready with her answers for the clarification round. Prime Minister, you have the floor. Good evening once again, Mr. Chairman, members of Parliament, people of St. Martin. Um, for the few clarifications, the member of Parliament, Westcott Williams, wanted to know in reference to the National Development Vision, whether the implementation mechanism is in place or is being put in place. I can confirm that it is being put in place. With respect to the English language, clarification that uh, she clarified that Parliament understand the time-consuming process, wanted me to indicate my willingness to take the initial steps. I thought that I already clarified that, but let me just state for the record that I am very much inter interested in elevating English as the first language in our country. And since it's a complicated matter, as soon as that is, um, let's say, fleshed out, it will be shared. As for the question relating to Article 59 of the Constitution and the feeling of government, this would have to be um, formulated and sent in writing. And <coughs> as to whether I can elucidate on the country package and whether the opening is there for further discussions on the country package related to the coming mutual agreement, um, whether there's a uh, mention made of the mutual agreement being for the country package being separate to the, for the package itself, I can say that we feel that we definitely have space to have further discussions on this, but it is being cemented now within our mutual agreement, and so I would prefer to share that once the mutual agreement has been shared, sorry, has been finalized. Then of course it will be shared with Parliament um, and then all of the ins and outs of that would be known to all. The SDG monitoring tool, um, yes, that was a statement being made, clarifying what was meant, that is clear. And the statements being made about the country, this is from MP Emanuel, indeed, as we concur that it, I, I wouldn't say that it's inaccurate. It is um, unfortunate that the details aren't there at government side at this time. And so definitely clarity will be sought as to the manner in which we are communicating to the public and who has the right to do such. Moving forward with the next question, clarification is needed regarding NRPB's execution of projects. On behalf of government, this is indeed already the case, as was asked by MP Bryson through you, Mr. Chairman, and they do, within the legislation, have the right to do so. <clears throat> Government would just have to take that decision, request it, and it would be executed. So with that being said, I've clarified what was asked from the members of parliament, and I thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman. I wish everyone a good evening. Thank you. Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs for your answers to the round one and the answers to the clarification. We would now adjourn for two minutes for the next Minister of Justice to take the floor. Meeting adjourned for two minutes.
Good evening, good night. Welcome back to the continuation of the public meeting. A special welcome to the Minister of Justice, Ms. Anna Richardson, and her support staff. Minister will be answering the first round of questions posed by the members of parliament. Minister, you have the floor. Uh, pleasant good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Pleasant evening to all um, members of parliament and all who are tuned in this evening. Uh, I will commence my answers starting with MP Sarah Westcott's questions. Please provide an overview on all our predecessors of the Minister of Justice or the Ministry of Justice. We begin with our first from 2010. October 2010 to June 2013, Mr. Roland Duncan. June 2013 to November 2015, Mr. Dennis Richardson. November 2015 to January 2016, Mr. Richard Gibson. January 2016 to December 2016, Mr. Edson Hidingdongo. December 2016 to January 2018, sorry, Raphael Bosman. January 2018 to 2019 of October, Mr. Cornelius De Weva. October 2019 to November 2019, Mr. Perry Hailings. November 2019 to March 2020, Mr. Egbert Duran. And from March 2020 until present, my person, yeah, yours truly, Anna E. Richardson. Who can sign on behalf of the government, in this case, the Ministry of Justice, to enter into financial agreements? That depends on the amount in an agreement or SLA. If the amount is less than 50,000 guilders, the Minister of Justice is, the authori is authorized to sign agreements based on the mandate registered. Um, you can see annex on that. However, if the amount is higher than 50,000 guilders, the Council of Ministers have to give permission to the Minister of Justice for signing. Any agreements or SLAs, Article 21 of the Rijkswet Financial Toezicht refers to this mandate register. Question number three, is it the intention of the Ministry of Justice to initiate the legislation on a ban on import, import on plastic bags? At the moment, no. No initiative is being taken in 2023 due to the limited capacity and set legislative agenda. However, it will be included in our 2024-25 agenda to further support this initiative. Question number four, is the Coast Guard contribution the part of St. Martin in the budget, the 4% for which we have a contractual agreement for? Yes, the amount taken up in the 2023 budget for the Coast Guard is the part of which St. Martin has a contractual agreement for. Question five, when the Minister of Justice chimed in on cannabis legislation, was that about decriminalization? This initiative is led by the Ministry of VSA. At a later stage in the legislative process, the Ministry, through the Department of Judicial Affairs, will be consulted. Indicate whether or our SLA are in conformity. I am asking that the outline of the service level agreement, or SLA, which is an attachment which is an attachment if minister for their part under the SLA, the outline would like to take every minister, every minister to take their portion and indicate whether these SLAs is they are, sorry, in conformity with the National Accountability Ordinance. And be sorry if we yeah, captured the question incorrectly, but we're gonna to try to answer it as best as we understood it. The ministry has noted a number of long-standing agreements that have been engaged and not all regulated in conformity. The initiative to ensure the ministry's agreement are reviewed, regulated, and renewed either through the required national decree or tendering procedure is an ongoing initiative that commenced in 2020. However, due to the limited capacity available to the ministry, the completion of this ongoing exercise is not finalized. However, it remains a priority focus throughout 2023. Question seven, the crime fund. Where are we, where we are with this, with the crime fund? We had a report from the council for maintenance of, of loss. So the rat von Rex van Harving 
in 2021. We had one in September 2022 complaining that hardly anything from the one in 2021 was done. What is the status of the crime fund? The improvement to the management of the crime prevention uh, fund as outlined in the report of the Law Enforcement Council and that of the country package H-12 is underway. SOR Bay has been engaged in the by the ministry to in assist in the preparations of the policy document, including work process and suggested legislative structure, as well as a formation plan for proper management of the crime prevention fund. SOR Bay presented a preliminary draft documentation which has since been reviewed by Judicial Affairs Department. Question eight. Oh, there's a second part to it, sorry. Currently, the ministry has received updated documentation, which is being reviewed. After the approval of the guidelines, they will be implemented and the needed training for staff will be provided by SOR Bay. Further, in accordance with recommendation of SOR Bay, an ordinance for the crime fund, is in a more infancy stage. However, it is a priority within the ministry's legislative agenda in 2023. Question eight, country packages are producing reports on St. Martin's need assessment on migration, migration governance. If you please, so what has been done with that report? <clears throat> to the best of our understanding uh, about this, question, we provide some information where migration is concerned. In the execution of such, the Ministry of Justice has formulated a plan of approach to strengthen border control on, my, on St. Martin or the ORV, ORVK. Parties involved in preparing the plan of approach includes the police force of St. Martin, the Customs Department, the Dutch Caribbean Coast Guard, the Royal Mil Military Police, the Immigration and Border Protection Service, and the Public Prosecutor's Office. As Minister of Justice, I have, I have approved the plan of approach on the 21st of October, 2022, and currently we are in the process of executing the first round of this project. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions posed by MP De Weaver. Question nine, why was the, there a 50% drop in the budget for the Executive Protection Unit? The EPS has been a planned unit to be developed for a number of years with a budget that has rolled over annually. No actual steps uh, other than today. Uh, this unit is officially being established. Um, considering the present activity to officially establish same or underway, having a reduced budget until the legal establishment is finalized is deemed feasible. Question 10, if the executive protection unit is still in existence, then how can 50% drop substantiate or, be, or motiv be motivated? EPS is made up of officers of both KPSM and Harvey Bay. There are no hefty expenses associated with the unit at this time. Exactly what is going on with Executive Protection Unit and whether or not it's still considered a pilot project and whether or not when it was formed, if it was based on a request from the Raad van Rex Handeling in the Netherlands. EPS is currently, uh, support, is currently supported service to the Council of Ministers or the CAM by officers that are loaned over by KPSM and Harvey Bay. The LIOL has been updated to include the unit and is currently under legal review. How is the overtime of the Executive Protection Unit done? Is it available or is it substanti substantiated in the account that was shown? Overtime is paid by the Ministry. Does the Executive Protection Unit receive a higher compensation because of the position they're in, if we have to compare it to something that we know, it would be the MP guesses about equivalent to the Secret Service in the US. Is there a different re remuneration for them because of the fact that their lives are at risk basically? At this time, the officer's compensation is what they have maintained either via KPSM or have a bay with overtime compensated where applicable. The MPs know that that executive protection unit is drastically understaffed and perform miracles once called upon. Are there plans to increase the manpower considering that we have seen ministries and the MP is not aware of how many persons are making up the unit? If there are plans to increase the manpower, by how many? 
Once the LIOL is finalized, approved by Parliament and ratified, steps will be taken to hire and expand the service as the official formation of EPS extends service to both the Governor and Parliament. Through you, um, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Heiliger Martin. Clarity about the claim that there is mandatory pictures of staff of IVP. The ministry had initiated in June 2022 initiative in relation to the prof professionalization of the image of the ministry which extends to its employees under the overall umbrella, umbrella of brand awareness such as digital presence, logos, and other branding. The employees of all departments being requested through this respective division head, their respective uh, division head to partake in an employee photo project. The communication regarding the logistics, time, date, and location, as well as details of the photo was to be from waist up to ensure clarity in regards to the appropriate uniform attire where applicable for the purpose of gaining professional employee photos. Noting an example of our age acting head of customs who has been asked and granted permission for the use of this photo to illustrate an example of the nature of this project's initiative. Through you, Mr. Chairman, on the screen, you'll see a picture of the acting head of customs. Mr. Bernardina on the left is the photograph that he took in a photo studio. And that same photo was used on one of the flyers that was created to be able to show the world uh, in connection with our first anti-counterfeiting anti -counterfeiting and intellectual property conference that was held last year in St. Martin. Mr. Chairman, through you, I want to communicate that the intentions of the ministry, again, is about professionalization. Everywhere in the world, law enforcement looks professional. We can't take screenshots or, 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 or snap, what do you call that? Um, selfies to use them as uh, professional photos. By extension, the ministry has had, have lost uh, a number of our personnel in the last few years. And unfortunately, we have had to use selfies and other common photos to be able to make bereavement flyers for our officers and staff. I am of the position that these should be professional photos, hence the reason I requested. It was not a demand, and so it was not stated as mandatory. It was a request for the staff to participate in taking these types of professional shots. I'd like to thank uh, the acting head of customs for agreeing to allow us to uh, have his photo placed on screen this evening to demonstrate the positive initiative on this subject matter. Question 16, I was informed that immigration officers have not received their placement letters as yet. Some clarity on this, please. The placement process and the dissemination of the placement letters is an ongoing process that involves preparation and presentation of some over 700 plus persons employed within the Ministry of Justice. These letters are being disseminated in batches as the process continues. The process is a large undertaking where printing and the filling into personalized envelopes and then being delivered to the various agencies. All, aid, all employees who are still to receive their letters are asked to understand that this project is physically being done by just four persons and with that, I am asking for your patience as your letters are on the way. Question number 17. Immigration mandatory personal development classes held outside of their working hours without overtime. Is it true that if they don't pass, they won't have their positions? Clarity is also needed on this mandatory part. The staff of the immigration are currently required to partake in the training program for all staff that this includes the mobile division of the department. The current training program is specifically aimed at the enhancement of job related skills related and tied to the employee's task. The current courses being executed is in the English and Dutch language courses. These training courses are currently scheduled at two sessions per courses four times per week. This phase of the training program is slated over three month, a three month time frame. In relation to the ministry ensuring continued service of this department, 
to the public and to accommodate the availability of the course teachers. To accommodate the availability of the course teachers and the scheduling of the staff to, that are to partake, the courses were scheduled as following. Four time slots, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., and 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I might remind that the Ministry of Justice is a ministry that works 24 hours a day. The mobile team is a team that works throughout the evening hours. Frontliners especially work on shifts. Administrative staff indeed work between the hours of some, some departments, 8 to 5, some 9 to 5, some 8.30 to 5, 4.30. The head of the immigration department has approached the staff with the proposal of being able to provide uh, time back where applicable. Um, the head also was under the impression that in those instances, you know, when you have staff come to you and say, you know, I have a situation, I need a little time off, no problem, go and take care of your situation, I understand. I guess it was poorly assumed that in instance like this where the ministry has also heard the calls of the staff saying that they need to be able to get certain trainings, and here we are trying to honor that but it is received negatively. Now, the word mandatory, I understand, because it is stipulated that if I end work at five o'clock, you can't tell me that I need to be anywhere mandatory. But that is something that could be simply worked out internally. Um, but again, I reiterate the fact that there, these are school teachers, school teachers, who have agreed to provide these language courses and due to their initial job, they can only be available at certain times. Hence the reason the schedule was structured the way it is. Nevertheless, if we aren't able to keep it within a three month time frame, because the hours will infringe on that of personal time, we will simply have to stretch the time longer as to how long these courses go. All staff are asked to partake in these training courses and are divided amongst the scheduled sessions, dependent on their initial assessment level of they are a part of the mobile division that works shifts or, or residency and admittance division. Uh, the employees to which it is applicable have also been duly informed that if they are to attend the session slated outside of the regular working time of that employee, the regulation regarding time back will be applied to the employees. So it is not a case that the employees are being requested to, uh, to, to contribute their time to this without any type of compensation as well as it is for their benefit. One of the things that I believe even MP Heilager asked if it wasn't uh, in the uh, central committee meeting um, is, is to be able to provide a list of all the court cases that we have. Well, a lot of the court cases that we have, um, you know, the, 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 the decisions of these court cases comes back because of certain errors that are made in our departments when the documents are being prepared. So to support our staff and help them to develop their skills in both the languages, it was decided that this might be a good contribution to provide for the staff. Question 18, a general um, question for the police. In general, for shifts, how many patrols are supposed to be out there in general? And in recent months or the last couple of weeks, how many patrols are actually out there? How many are supposed to be out there? And how many are actually out there? With all due respect through you, Mr. Chairman, it is not advisable to share specifics of police operation or the amount of patrol on the streets in public meetings. This is vulnerable police information. In the wrong hands, it will expose police officers working on the streets of St. Martin to safety issues and possibly endanger their lives. As a matter of 
national security, this is um, not advised. And Pika Heilager, however, through you, Mr. Chairman, the Chief of Police welcomes you to contact him directly for this information, and this is also extended to all MPs that are interested. Question 19, What's, what SDGs are assigned to the Ministry of Justice and why? The sustainable development goal related to the Ministry of Justice is SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. The initiatives of, of under SDG 16 are focused on strengthening our institutions by improving their effectiveness, efficiency, and quality. Progress has been made in the police force and court of guardianship. Furthermore, our police force have established good working relationships with partners in and outside the kingdom, and there are several cross-border agreements in place. There is also a kingdom-wide security strategy being finalized, which addresses issues related to immigration, border protection, and the prevention of human drugs and arms, tra arms trafficking. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I go on to questions from MD MP Peterson. In September 2021, in a press release, it was announced that there were, will be a new committee for complaints against police violence. Where is this committee reflected in the budget? And also, why is the budget post for um, Wervan van Politie to get more police officers at zero? The appointment of, of committee members of this complaints committee. Sorry, one second. In accordance with the National Ordinance Complaint Committee for Police Action and Law Enforcement, Complaint Committee was established uh, by national decree on April 26, 2022. The committee became operational in December 1 or December 1st, 2022, when a secretary was also appointed. The complaint committee consists of three members with a relevant level of experience or expertise, knowledge in law enforcement, legal and social field. The committee has an external and independent body that handles complaints about the conduct of law enforcement officers. It is not limited to the conduct of police officers, however. Moreover, the committee forms a separate body and operates separately from the existing complaint procedure of the Internal Affairs Bureau of the Police Force of St. Martin and the Ombudsman. The complaint committee uh, can be filed, or complaint can be filed by filling an online form um, at the website of the Ministry of Justice. And I would invite you to be able to visit the Ministry of Justice and you will find the form for said complaint application. Number 21, about the budget post for the St. Martin prisoners in Holland. Budget post 43498. After Irma, I remember that we had about 15 or 16 prisoners that went off to Holland. However, last week the minister informed that of the original group, only six prisoners, I believe, are left in Holland. So why is this post still budgeted at 2.8 million guilders? because this cannot be what we are currently paying for nearly six prisoners when the cost of a prisoner is about $300 a day. Some clarity on that aspect would be appreciated. Currently, the budgeted allocation reflects the payment, and I have to correct myself here. Indeed, last week it was stated as six. It's actually 10 inmates housed in the Netherlands at 339 euros per day per inmate in 2023. The figure of the 2.8 million is also uh, considering an outstanding amount that is owed to Curacao for also housing um, inmates of St. Martin there. Question 22. For some clarification concerning some statements that you made last week, namely that she is going to do the payment for the police the right way. In light of this, what exactly went wrong in the previous payment then under the tenure of the predecessor? Was the payment made to the police around December 29, 2020 done in the right lawful way? Either yes or no. And if not, what went wrong exactly back then? And what is it that you, as Minister of Justice, currently want to do differently compared to how it was done by the minister executed the task? The national decrees establishing 
the Rex Positsi is an El Bay Ham, the salary scales an El Bay, and an enactment decree on El Bay for already approved function book. This is the full legislative package and the legal instrument needed to place the employees of justice in the required functions and salary point positions. This full package has, a, has to be ratified by His Excellency Governor to enter into force. At that time, payment regarding old retroactive uh, corrections will be initiated. The payment made in 2020 was executed as an advance against future retroactive corrections. I have been guided through the required legislative process in which I can ensure the needed national decrees for employees is ratified by His Excellency. This is the only way to reach the required legal instrument to finalize the retroactive corrections and payments owed. But one thing I want to say here as well, Mr. to you, Mr. Um, Chairman, is that at no point in time did I ever say anything was done wrong previously. What I have said is that it is necessary for these legal documents to be done this way. It cannot be done by a ministerial decree. It has to be done by a national decree with general measures, that is the LB Hum for the Rexpositsi. There's no quick, fast way to be able to do it because from the moment that I came into this capacity, it has been pay it now, sign it now, do it now. And one side I'm hearing that, do it now, say it now. And in some cases by some of the very MPs for you, Mr. Chairman, do it now, when now, how now, what date? And then in the same breath I'm hearing um, what is the legal way? What is the correct way? You know, um, and, and, and I know that I've even heard through you, Mr. Chairman, um, um, MPs be able to quote legislations and articles. Like so, so, the, so the MPs are, are aware of what the legal structure is to be able to execute this. And I know that the MPs are aware that the way that we are going about it right now is the correct way. So this, this thing of cons at least 10 times I've been asked this question constantly, every time, and I'm not, I'm not sure what it is they expect me to say different, but at the end of the day, at no time have I said anything was done wrong. I'm speaking about present day, what my responsibility is, and I am doing it the way that I know I have to do it, which is through these proper legal instruments. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Arundel. How does each minister feel about the budget? I understand the financial discipline needed and will continue to work within the parameters that are set and submit the needed amendments when and where necessary. Question number four, how are, 24, sorry. How are we with the complaint, compliant international, com, how are we with the compliant international human rights standard regarding the state of the jail facilities? Based on our latest information, we remain compliant with the international human rights standards regarding the state of our detention facilities. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Bryson. Police officers receiving position letters, and I'm actually gonna read all of the questions or the points that was made from MP and then give one answer that I believe will cover all uh, the questions. First of all, I wanna thank the MP for his um, his transparency and how, you know, um, open he was about his experience and was able to be able to still pay attention to certain things and he brought that in his delivery here on the floor of parliament. So thank you MP Bryson for all that you shared about your experience and all you heard with the officers. For example, he goes in and says, how is the procedure going in terms of the distribution of the letters? Have all the police officers received those letters as yet? What is the process when they, when they reply to it or for them to confirm? What is the process for them to reply or for them to confirm? Do they have to wait for them to be able to accept it? Um, being that some of them are happy with what they receive while some police officers or all police officers seem to have received something under Hurst van Bewaring adding, um, and I'm not sure if they have received it as yet. I don't know if it's going by the department, by department. Can minister please clarify and give an update 
uh, can an update be provided? The, the placement process, as I indicated before, and the dissemination of these letters is a very large undertaking. We have to see to it that 700 plus employees receive personalized letters. That means that we're printing large batches um, and we are placing all of these into envelopes. The envelopes have to be personalized. These batches are then taken to the departments and given to the department heads who would then disperse. All employees who are still to receive their letters, as I asked earlier, I'm asking you to please um, have some patience. This evening, uh, employees, if they were to go ahead, and I'm inviting them to do that, to check their emails. Through the intranet, we published a newsletter um, which does give an overall breakdown um, on the various aspects of this process. So they will get information on the placement committee. Who are the members? What is the role and responsibility? How it was legally established? Um, the same thing about the Bazoir Committee or the Appeals Committee. Who, the, who are the members? How does that process go? How can you get in contact with the members of these two committees? What is the current status on the calculation? What is the status on the placement process? Um, if you need to get in touch with the HR Department of the Ministry of Justice, how do you do that? So I'm encouraging all of our staff to please check your work email um, accounts and you should receive the newsletter uh, that would give you, I believe, all the information you would need at this time. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to give answers to the first round questions. Thank you, Minister Anna Richardson. I now go to clarification, and I see MP Grisha Halliger martin A pleasant good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening to my fellow colleagues. Good evening to the Minister of Justice and her support staff. Thank you, Minister, for your answers today. Uh, not a clarification per se, but a ra ra rectification. Because um, the Minister, I, from what I was told, stated, um, from what I just heard, stated that it was not mandatory and that it was asked for them to have the photo done. But this was what was received in the WhatsApp chat. Good afternoon to all. Information received from the Minister's Cabinet that the Ministry is working on a photo project and it is also mandatory for the border workers to comply with this instruction. Instruction. You have been informed by your respective team leaders and the necessary list will be compiled and sent to management. Now my issue, I understand the, the, the minister would like to have, I understand the, the essence of the project, but the fact that it's staying mandatory, that's a red flag for me. And secondly, normally, when you use pictures of people, you allow them to sign off on a, a photo waiver or a release form. Was this ever done? For just for clarity's sake. Or was it just verbally, I agree, you can go ahead. That's one. Regarding the, cl the, the classes, this was the email that was received a couple days or a week before. Good day to all. I would like to inform you that, you that the mandatory personal development classes and mandatory personal development is bolded, Mr. Chairman. That the mandatory development classes in Dutch, English, and the BOA, BOA are being scheduled and should begin March 20th, 2023. The Dutch and English classes, A1, A2 level, will be for a three months period at the Milton Peters College, and the BOA classes will be four months and date and time and place to be announced. Please revert to the MDR for scheduling and note. This is very important, Mr. Chairman. You're listening? Okay, good. I know you're a little sleepy. You look tired. Schedule is subject to change. Overtime is not paid for personal development. Now, I say this to you, Mr. Chair, and I mean that clearly. Some, as the minister clearly stated, some workers work the regular hours. And those workers this week, Mr. Chairman, had to go to that cla those classes after working hours. And they have a fundamental problem with that. So I ask the minister to please rectify that. Maybe clarity. Maybe there was a miscommunication. I don't know, but there's something not, um, something is amiss. And um, I think the minister should look into it. Um, as to up to date, some of them has not received anything in writing stating that they will have overtime or time back. Nothing from what the minister is saying thus far. So maybe just 
to rectify the issue. I'm just asking politely if possible. My last um, clarification, well, not a clarification. I haven't received a response to one of my, my one other question, my last question to the minister is, what SDG is assigned to the Minister of Justi Justice and, and why? What SDG is assigned to the Ministry of Justice? Was it there already? Yes? No, but if it's on, we're going to receive this in, in, are we going to receive a copy of this, Mr. Chairman? The presentation? Or if she can, maybe she can just repeat it again, would be great for me, okay? That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha Harlegan Martin, and I'm very much wide awake. The next person is MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my thanks to the Minister of Justice for her responses provided. And, Mr. Chairman, in connection with those responses, the following. Minister, thank you, and I understand the part with respect to the legislation that would govern the import or the ban on import of plastic bags. It cannot happen this year, and um, the minister is looking at it for next year. And minister, if you can just confirm with respect to the ban itself, was that one of the areas where there is a multidisciplinary arrangement between your ministry and uh, I believe the ministry of TIAT or did that, was that something else that is in my mind with respect to the execution of the ban itself? So if you could just maybe repeat that in terms of the, um, what is going to be done with respect to the ban, the steps to be taken. I know you had answered it before and I'm wondering, was that a multi-ministerial approach or do I have some, am I thinking of something else where that is concerned? Um, so, just if the minister could clarify that for me, please. Uh, minister, maybe, Mr. Chairman, through you, maybe the minister did not understand it as a question, and I could understand if she did not understand it as a question, when I made a reference to the overtime for the police and the cut in the overtime for the police. So, I want to phrase that question differently and ask the minister if she can provide me with the amount of overtime paid to police officers during the month of January and February. If I can just, a global, a global number. January and February 2023, overtime actually paid out to the police officers. And then, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the minister gave an answer to my question as to what was done with the St. Martin Needs Assessment on Migration. So the report on the St. Martin Needs Assessment on Migration was made by the IOM. And the IOM states in its introduction to this report that the Migration Governance Needs Assessment, which have been implemented in countries in Central America and the Caribbean, and now implemented in St. Martin, address the challenges and opportunities for guaranteeing that migration to, from, and within the region occurs through well-managed migration policies and mechanisms. This report for St. Martin has been contextualized to the island's particular situation and published in both English and Dutch, provides key information to support the government in understanding the current migration governance system. The report highlights specific identified needs to support informed decision making to strengthen migration governance that will benefit both the state and migrants from that report that I asked the minister about. So the minister in her response to me, in her response to us had indicated that she was not sure what I meant with my question regarding the St. Martin needs assessment on migration and she did give an answer that could have fit my question but then said um, that she was not sure, the minister was not sure. So now going a little deeper into the introduction in that report, um, can the minister indicate whether what was presented as being done is in line with or on the basis of that particular report? Is anything been done with that report? So was there any coordination with that report and what the minister and our government has to do is my question. Mr. Chairman, the, 
the minister gave an uh, update, gave an answer to my question regarding the crime fund. And a minister understanding that the steps that have been taken and the SOAB to be involved and a report that has been received and an initial report and another one to follow. So what happens right now where the crime fund is concerned and income that should go into the crime fund? So how does, is, is there anything happening with respect to a crime fund right now while this that you indicated minister is being is being done. And then, Mr. Chairman, the minister had, I had asked a question previously, and the minister in her responses had indicated that she was not sure what I was referring to. And through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, minister, I had mentioned that the, 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 the government indicated that there was a risk so I had asked you about the four million guilders to pay police officers and where did that come from? And the minister was not sure where I got that information from. So I'm going to clarify to the minister that in the financial implementation report, so as you know, as you should know, Mr. Chairman, every quarter we receive a financial report from the government. In that report, they would list, amongst other things, potential risks. So in the last quarter of 22 financial report that we got, it was mentioned as one of the risks under the Ministry of Justice, four million guilders, a financial risk, and that had to do with payment to police officers. That, and my question was, where did that come from? Where did that number come from? In, in, and it was the last quarter's report. So I'm talking the report up to December 2022. So I just wanted to clarify that for the minister and look forward to receiving the clarifications that she can provide now. Thank you. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. I will look at Minister of Justice if she's ready to answer. Yeah, I have, I have two questions. Yes. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to go back or start with the questions, if I can recall them properly, from MP Heilager. Um, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, MP, the first thing you read was a WhatsApp chat, a WhatsApp chat. I'm not sure how I, as minister, would be able to justify uh, an author in a chat that I am not in that uses the word mandatory. I'm not sure how you seek for me to do that. Um, secondly, you made mention that the letter you read that talked about the mandatory courses, one of the things, and, and even your person through you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, MP Heiliger, you asked that we note the following. And the next sentence you read stated along the lines that the schedule is subject to change. Yes. So in the scheduling being subject to change, there's flexibility there to be able to adjust accordingly, okay? And it is a, a situation where we seek to be able to give the staff exactly what they have asked for, which is the support to help them build and be able to be better in their service line. Now, it comes down to a conversation. If the staff is saying that the hours that is being adjusted for them doesn't work, the ministry or the department will work with them. That's all I can say on the matter. That's all I can say on the matter. And as well, as indicated, time back is what would be rendered to the staff. Um, if I may, through you, Mr. Chairman, move on to the questions of, or the clarification for MP. Um, sorry? Oh, the SDG, did you want me to go through that? Number 16, for the Ministry of Justice. We talk about SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Yeah, it's there. Um, do we still have the notes from the staff? Thank you. The overhead line. Um, so, when it comes to the overtime from January and February for 2020, and this is for MP um, Westcott Williams, was asking about overtime. 
January 2023 was 127,733. February 2023, it's 14167. January of 2022, it was 144,372. And February of 2022, it was 144,228. There was another question. Um, some other questions that were asked that I'd like to be able to clarify. Minister, can you confirm the ban and such? Is that the one area that is the ban between the ministry, the ministry of Teat? So what will happen with the ministry of Teat when it comes to the existing initiative that is to be enacted? is a mandate and even when you were presenting this and we had discussions on it it was indicated that it is a difficult task for the police even though it's an ordinance of the police that was uh, amended it is difficult for the police to be expected to execute this as such the execution is going to be done by the inspectorate of tax of tier sorry will be mandated to carry out the controls because it, is, because it is closely linked to their other control tasks. And I hope that I was able to bring clarity there. I covered the overtime. Minister, can you provide me with an amount of overtime paid? I did that. With regards to the migration, indeed, the migration of the, um, the re migration report, we have not at this time done anything with the report you're making reference to. However, it is the intention to use the report as part of our immigration and border protection services developments. Nothing has been done just yet with that report. Um, is there anything happening concerning the crime fund? Nothing in terms of usage of any funds. Within late, lately, we haven't done anything out of it. I do believe there is a credit that has been done by the prosecutor's office. I would have to see what that is. I'm not sure where that stands, but the details can be provided, Mr. Chairman, through you. And finally, I'm hoping that I'm covering all that was asked in a financial implementation report published for the fourth, um, fourth quarter of 2022 is the enlisted amount, potential risk. Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a particular a question that I will have to get more research on, and if I can provide this maybe in writing to MP, I would appreciate it, but the decision is hers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for providing the answers of the questions in round one, and also the clarification. I would like to adjourn for three minutes to change over to Minister of Finance, who will be the next. Meeting adjourned.
Good night and welcome back to the continuation of this public meeting number 16 of today, Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. A special welcome to the Minister of Finance and Acting Minister of Romi, Mr. Ardwell Irion and his support staff. As a notification, we are no longer on the TV15 Sauliga headlines, seeing the time, but we are we can be followed on YouTube and Pearl 98.1 via radio. Minister of Finance, you have the floor. Good evening, all. Good evening to the viewers. Is the presentation up? Okay, so this is the main screen, right? Oh, perfect. Yes, um, and seeing that, um, hearing the comments during the budget debate in regards to cuts and cuts and cuts and so forth, I thought I clarified a little bit um, on that. I also heard um, some good comments from MP William Allen, also some comments from MP Gums in, regards, in regarding the budget itself and our income. and. Some of the comments were, you can only spend a dollar once, or you only could spend a cent once. And again, we showed this in the presentation. If you look at the budget 2022 actuals, right, our income was 468 million guilders. We have an increase for budget 2023 of 495 million guilders. When persons refer to cuts, they're referring to a budget amendment of 2022, which was 520 million guilders. But if you look at the income at that point in time that we were projecting, it was 490 million guilders. So of course, as MP William Marley mentioned, if, you're, if you have an inflated budget, right, and you're back down to a realistic budget, then we are having cuts, so-called cuts. But no, we don't have cuts. We're working with the most realistic budget that we have based on our income. In addition to that, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the last few weeks or even months, I've heard MPs talk about, let's say, uh, the independence of St. Martin, all right? Independence comes with pull up, pulling our socks up, all right? And understanding this is the income that we have, right? We don't want the creative support from, 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 the, from, help, from the Nels anymore. Uh, we don't want, you don't want to borrow money anymore. So if we don't want to do that, all right? And we want to strive towards a more independence, then we have to deal with the income that we have, all right? So, Again, I'll say it again, this is the most realistic budget that we've had. Um, we've cleaned up as much as possible. And what I see as a government and as members of parliament that we need to do is, as the members of parliament, we hold us accountable to make sure that we execute the tasks that we say to generate the revenues that we say we're going to generate. And I think that's the task for us as a government. We are going to strive for our best to get it done to continue to generate rev revenue, even more revenue than we have here, Mr. Chairman. But again, I want to strive on, we were cutting from uh, inflated uh, budget in regards to what we wanted. And with that budget, we would have needed the creative support, right? We then went to a balanced budget without the creative support. Mr. Chairman, I will now go over to the answers and questions, I'll start first with MP Melissa Gums. MP Gums had a question regarding the projected income from the tourist tax and the Airbnb tax. And the answer for MP Gums was no additional tax laws are required to collect taxes related to the Airbnb. Those taxes can be collected on the current tax system. I now move over to questions by MP De Weaver. MP De Weaver had a general question regarding the <coughs> budget and the IMF and the central bank and the GDP and the growth. The answer to that is the projections of IMF and central bank GDP growth are somewhat lower than our estimations in the budget projections because we also take into account new policies. The projections given by IMF and CBS Central Bank assume a consistent policy. However, we have included additional measures that are either taken, that are taken into, taken into consideration compliance 
or additional existing policy. This explains a small difference in government revenue projections. I now go over to the questions from MP Christoph Emanuel. MP Christoph Emanuel asked, does the Minister of Finance stand by the image, the design of the number plate? And if his answer is yes, then I would like to ask the minister if he intends to recall on the number of plates and why. Yes, MP, I do stand by the design of the plate. I, do, I believe the young lady did a great job by the design of the plate. But in addition to that, MP, and I do understand why you may have been a little confused in regarding the number plate size, because from what I have observed is that you don't have a number plate uh, from the dot side. But what I have here is one of our government plates. And it is according to what you mentioned, the additional six. So MP, you have a, a printed copy, but today we have the plate and I can also ask any, any member to, any person in the public to measure their own plate to see. And now move on to the second question. Who did the execution of the plate and did they know the regulations? Did the minister, uh, did the minister and those doing the ex execution of the plates research the plates? Annually, a regulation establishing the valid number of plates for the following tax year is published. The regulation establishing the number plates for 2023 is also published in the ABE 2023-08 in Article 2, Paragraph 2 of the Reikling Number Platen 2023. The dimensions of the number plates and letters are, you can take it with you, Auntie. Yeah. yeah, you can take it. The dimensions of the plate must be between five and 7.5 centimeters. This is stated in the regulation of 2023 as well as in 2012 and even 2011. As a new plate number is 66 centimeters, it is in line with the regulation. The MP asked, the consultant who is supposed to be working on the backlog is giving employees instructions and honors. Are you aware of that? Yes, I'm aware that a consultant was brought in to assist acting head of the business unit. Next question. MP asks, on the 16.3 million guilders, was either given directly to the government of St. Martin or stems from expertise that has been produced in the Netherlands. How much of the equivalent was given to government directly? And this was regarding the TRIO newspaper report. The project ICT, tax authority, 8.5 million. The enterprise re resource planning for government, 2.86 million. The financial management, 770,000. The cost and effectiveness public sector, 1.6 million. And theme C, 1.5 million. Economic development, 400,000. Healthcare, 445,000. And general, 56. This total, the 16.3 million that the MP asks about. MP asks, how much of it was for us and how much was it of expertise out of the Netherlands. It is not registered like that, but at the moment, about six million is already available on the central bank account. So it isn't specific on how it's registered. What are those expertise? Can I minister give a list of expertise? 
the finance received expertise for the, for the transition of the tax administration and also public financial management, which include the cleanup of the financial administration and the transition to the ERP system. How much of the 120 million euros for projects are coming to St. Martin? With that, it is not clear yet. How much of the 120 million euros is coming to St. Martin? That is yet to be determined. How much funds are available in total for country packages? How much was already committed? Based on article, based on article, um, it said 120 million euros is available for country packages, Curacao, St. Martin. With regard to the pipelines, this is a Terrio pipeline, main the pipeline of Terrio, the, tempor the temporary working organization. The next answer. In the newspaper article, the TVO was mentioned, not Mr. Adrian Alberts. However, to further answer your question, MP, Mr. Alberts is an employee of Bezeka, TVO, in the function of the liaison, St. Martin. From that perspective, he is involved with the country packages of which these items are part of. The next question was answered by General Affairs. The government strong, it was a regarding a survey that was, part, that was executed by General Affairs. Next, according to the Lanceville Ordering, is there a Director of Taxes? According to the General Ordinance on Taxes, there is a Director of Taxes. However, based on the National Ordinance Structure and the Organization Government in conjunction with the National Decree containing General Measures, Organization of the Ministry of Finance, this is the Head of the Department of the Tax Administration, the Dean's Hoth. What are the requirements and the job description of the, this director? The function is an academic, academic education level defined in the function book. What is the organization of the administration? This is based on figures from December 2022, the tax office, the tax office section, support services, 24 FTEs, eight not filled, Receiver's office, 58, nine not filled. Tax inspectorate, 38, seven not filled. Control and detection, 23 FTEs, 14 not filled. The tax department has no director, but a tax, but a department head. The function is at academic level defined again in the function book. What is the percentage of unfilled FTEs within each department of the tax administration? It is 33% for the department support, 18% for receivers, 18% for inspection, and 60% for the audit. Is there a criminal investigation within the audit department? If yes, how many people? There are currently eight people working in the audit department. The percentage of filled FTEs in that department is 35%. How is it possible that a head of tax administration is filling out these positions of almost 10 years and, not, and no minister has established a correction in the behavior? Automatically, when there's a vacancy for a department, the head of the tax administration must act as a head until such time that someone is appointed to act in that function. Vacancies were published not only in St. Martin, but also in Curacao. These ads were also published on the website for the government of St. Martin as well as the website, the Amigo newspaper, but to no avail. In the audit department, two different staffers were offered the opportunity to act as a supervisor for the existing staff, and both employees declined because they did not want to manage the employees in that section. RTS is collecting, and this is against the law. Are you aware of that? RTS does not collect taxes, nor does anyone, nor does any other work for the tax administration. How long has the other department been working without a head? The two other departments, namely the receivers, has a head, and the inspector has an acting head. Next question. The audit criminal investigation department will only have three employees in 2026. Is it the intention to have SBOP take over the audit department under a different name, such as RTS? No, the ministry is no, the Ministry of Finance is actively working on recruiting more staff for that department. Also, four workers are currently attending classes to afford them the opportunity. 
to be promoted within the successful courses. It is not the intention for SBOP to, to take over the arts in that department. When was the last time a vacancy was advertised before March 16, 2023? As I mentioned before in the CC, um, we obviously had a job fair last year where a majority of vacancies within the Ministry of Finance, especially within the tax department, were advertised and we have successful job ministry, I mean job fair. But the last time um, was October 2022 at the Dutch Caribbean Careers website and before that locally in July 2022. Does the audit department of St. Martin have these type of managers to help the team accomplish their goals? All departments within tax administration can go to their respective managers for assistance. In the annual planning discussions, the audit staff are informed to seek assistance from the tax inspectors, but they can also inform the acting head of their concerns and assistance will be provided. <coughs> Who corrects the reports of the auditor before it's sent out and how does the, the, those departments have the tools and equipment to carry out their report. The acting head of the audit department reads the reports and provides the feedback to the auditors. Next answer. The audit department has phones that are topped up when needed. The auditor's phones are only needed while they are in the field. Most of their work are in the office. Lately, the printers have not been working optimally, and the government IT department is looking into this matter. The next question was related to the adjunct accountant, SBOP RTS. And uh, while for SBOP and RTS, they will, they will receive an advancement in the job, is the ministry aware of this? RTS organized an adjunct accountant course for its employees. The director of the ATS offered the tax administration the possibility to add workers to fill the classes. For the tax administration, the classes are for any staff member that management would like to have included. The name of some assessors, as well as the auditors within, with the exception of those on the extended sick leave at the time of planning and those retiring this year, were submitted for the courses. Next question, for persons working in tax administration, it is mandatory, is it mandatory for them to follow the course? But not, they are not going to get advancement, how is that? The classes are mandatory because it is part of the continuous learning to adequately keep up with the nuances of the fiscal landscape. Taking these courses does not mean an automatic advancement. Advancements are performed a performance base. Also hearing the concerns of the staff recently, I was able to develop an understanding and what is wanted from the staff in terms of certifications for the future advancements, not only for government, but also personal development, which I am all in favor of. Next question. While well, for SBAP and RTS, they will receive an ad advancement in the job. Is the minister aware of this? No, I'm not aware of this. The next question, according to LMA, an interim head can only stay in the function for one year. After you must be placed in the interim section head, in the section head position, is the minister aware that in the tax administration, there's an interim section head business tax individual for the past 12 years? I was recently made aware of that. Next question, the tax administration that is there, the workers are carrying out their functions but being paid according to the scale of their functions. That is a violation of the law. Is the minister aware of those issues, in particular of the tax department? And if the minister says yes, what can the minister do in this tenure thus far? And what has he done to remedy these situations? Honestly, I'm not too sure what the MP has been is asking in this question. Is the MP saying that the workers are performing tasks that are outside of their function? So that it wasn't clear to me. In addition to that, um, as minister, I don't micro, micromanage every single department. But as I mentioned before, I did have discussions with the staff recently where they did express some of their grievances. 
On the part of communication, does not, it does not exist in the administration, in the tax administration. The system was down as of the 9th of February. What was the cause of it? And he asked if I was aware of it. For the security update to be successful, new servers were installed. This caused the system to be temporarily unavailable. And as of Wednesday, February 2nd, 22nd, 2023, the system was up and running again. What are the plans for the head of administration? Workers never here, neither at the beginning of, or during the year. What are the plans stipulated for the department and the tax administration department? Micromanagement is a tool to attend to workers' issues. Each department performs a yearly plan. That plan is then evalu evaluated twice a year, once during the middle of the year and then at the end of the year. When was the last time the department was made Department plan was made by the head of the tax administration. Plans were made for the tax administration, trans tax, administra tax administration transformation in 2018 and 2021. But without the capital investment budget, these plans could not be executed. These plans have been taken up in the country package. The steering, the steering group just recently approved the transformation plan and it's on its way to the Council of Ministers for approval. When was the last time a team meeting was held for the audit department? Because when the workers asked for a meeting, it was not considered. In January 2023, a meeting request was not honored as the head of tax held discussions during the HR planning with the members of the department. The planning discussion of the HR cycle was held within one week after the request was made. Who is tasked with the implementation of the OECD regulation for the tax administration? Article 2.2G of the General Ordinance of Taxes defines the competent authority. Article 62 of the General Ordinance of the Taxes says that the competent authority is the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance may mandate this authority. Next question, at some point it pays out People double, then after the receiver's file, they will collect some. I am aware of instances when double payment goes out. The, treasur the Treasury Department keeps me up to date when they with the implementation of the new ERP system. This challenge has been taken up and will be addressed. We are entering the next question, we are entering the phase of execution. This year, 2023 and 2024, the public will see the rollout of a new system and taxes. Can, can the minister break down and explain the new tax, the system of taxes, and where in the budget do we see this? The new tax and financial system was included in the capital investment in the budget 2023. In addition to this, we had at least two to three tax meetings, um, the Committee of Finance, where we discuss all the new legislation and potential legislation and also ask for input from the MPs regarding taxes. Next question, on whose behalf does Mr. Alberts work, speak? He works for Tevio and supports the country packages and his role as liaison for St. Martin. The next question was, can the minister provide a breakdown of these new taxes? There is no list of new taxes. However, during my presentation on the improvement of the new tax system with the Finance Committee of Parliament on February 8th and February 23rd, 2023, propo proposals for the improvement of the tax system have been shared with the Finance Committee. Please be aware that a copy of my presentation was also shared with Parliament. The next steps, for, the next steps are for the tax improvement work groups that assess the feasibility of all the proposed tax improvements and draft an advice for the Council of Ministers for approval. After the approval from the Council of, of Ministers, the tax improvements will be calculated by external experts and drafted by legislation and consultation sessions will be held by stakeholders, as I mentioned before, before the actual concepts are submitted to Parliament for the approval. The next question, was he mandated by government? No. <laughs> the next 
X. The next question. Recently, the head of the tax administration brought in a consultant to work side by side with her while the consultant is pending for the court case. Breach of integrity, the, men the MP mentioned, a friend, of the, a friend of the head of the tax administration, that is called nepotism. The function is not being advertised at no point in time, yet the function for the work of the section head was advertised. So the interim section head, income tax, who started working way after the section head business tax was able to apply for the position. And the other section head is still waiting for the position to be made available. The MP then asks, the consultant is supposed to be working on the backlog and is given employees instructions and honors, are you aware of that? Mr. Chairman, I think that this is um, during the budget debate. There was at least two to three accusations of nepotism, and I could understand why uh, individuals would go to the good MP regarding nepotism because of his experience um, with that, and. That's one of the, each, the, the items that we are trying to tackle in this government. As I mentioned before um, in the Roman presentation, one of the reasons why we brought in the integrity chamber to tackle issues of nepotism and to also end such behaviors of the past. For example, Mr. Chairman, um, true nepotism is when we have a minister that gives a contract, uses two quotations, and one quotation happens to be the husband of the chief of staff. And the second quotation happens to be a family member that lives on the premises. So when we talk about true nepotism, right, I can understand why certain individuals would, would go there, Mr. Chairman, and for advice because of the professional experience that the minister has. And it's not just one, instance, with multiple instances. And now move on to the questions. from MP Sarah Riscott Williams. MP asks the question regarding uh, all the prior predecessors to myself, and that would be Hiroshi Gamoto, Roland Tuwit, Mr. Hassink, Richard Gibson, Michael Perry, Perry Hillings, and myself as last. MP asked, we would like to know how the government is executing the budget. A very important topic in the executing of the budget is to manage liquidity. That means both the income side and the expenditure side are monitored continuously. Parliament is informed about the financial and policy adjustments. When developments require changes outside the budget parameters, a budget amendment will be prepared. The next question, when would Minister of Finance have been discussing the issue of cryptocurrency in general? The Minister indicated that he has approached 
the subject to the central bank? The answer, I am aware of the letter regarding the investment policy of the central bank of Curacao and San Martin. My counterpart in Curacao's main concern is, of the course, the negative results due to the market conditions. Obviously, neither I nor the central bank itself are happy with these results. However, with the last year's market conditions, these results were unavoidable. The central bank has, fixed, has a fixed income portfolio with a high average invested capital in held bonds. My counterpart in Curacao questions this policy. The central bank will evaluate its investment policy, which has been discussed in the quarterly meetings. The next question. Is there an up-to-date ma mandate registry? When was the last one updated? When was it published? Who can sign off on behalf of the government? The, the latest registry expired in November 2022 and will be updated within short. The next question was regarding Airbnb and the estimated five million dealers. As answered during the Central Committee meeting, the amount projected is based on the approximate amount of money generated by Airbnb rentals in 2022. The Ministry of Finance will engage in an exercise to locate and inform individuals and or companies of their tax obligation and as it pertains to the rental of property. The Ministry has been testing software to see how many homes, how many home sharing properties are on the island, their income, their size, and their value. Mr. So Chairman, the next answer is regarding the Minister of Finance. I'm sure I have, he, I have heard of the letter to the Central Bank by his colleague of Curacao, and, and people would like to know my thoughts on that. As I previously answered, it is my aim to submit the first stage of the draft legislation at the Department of Legal Affairs and the legislation in the third quarter of 2023. Having said the above, it is my intention to abolish, clean up, to abolish and clean up the first tax national ordinance that are not applied in practice. Therefore, we must determine which legislation this will be and if that can be done this year. It will be clear in the third quarter of this year, but it is my intention to abolish them this year. And if we ask a question regarding Central Bank and Mullah Bay, the answer is, as mentioned during the Central Committee's meeting, that your letter on the Bay property development was received and the answers are forthcoming in accordance with Article 62 of the Constitution and Article 69 of the Rules of Order of Parliament of St. Martin. I expected, that, I expected to answer the questions that were posed earlier, however, by, the, by my letter with reference number 4653 of March 16, 2023, I informed Parliament that the answers will be provided within three weeks from now or earlier as possible in accordance with Article 69 of the Rules of Order. And just for the record, the relevant motion was shared with Central Bank and a follow-up is expected within short. The next answer, yes, finance complies with the National Accountability Ordinance. And now move on to the Questions from MP Grisha Helga Martin. Does the government does the government periodically evaluate the contracts based on criteria? The contracts are evaluated after the contract period, so when we have to tender again, government will then have to go through the entire process of making the tour and evaluating the submitted bids. Has the government determined how it will address the compensation of the budget deficits for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022 in combination with its multi-animal repayment obligation? The manner in which the government will address the compensation of the budget deficits of the past year has been explained in the quarter four report, which was shared with both the parliament and the CFT on, in February. And I refer to her to chapter four of the quarter four report. Has the minister read the fact sheet of article 73? 
Yes. Which SSGs are assigned to the Minister of Finance and why, as I mentioned before, there are no SSGs assigned to any ministers. I don't even know why that question was asked in that manner, but um, the government is directed um, by our national development plan where the SDGs um, have been um, applied. I now move on to the questions for MP George Pontefer. Does the government have any laws to receive any funds from people who bring plants and animals into St. Martin? As far as import duties excise and excise are concerned, apart from a special import duty on gasoline, St. Martin has no import duties or excise taxes on these items. I do know that the Ministry of TIAC is working on this policy, though, MP. Now move on to the questions from MP Rolanda Bryson. MP Bryson asks, how much was put into SRP and other enterprise support projects? MP, a total amount of 96.6 million gillers has been put into SRP, which supported over 6,000 employees and over 1,200 employers on the island. This is, a, this is the total amount that was paid to employers for the employees. However, this does not include the system set of fees or fees rendered by SED. Next question was regarding to the tourism taxes. Yes, I can confirm that accommodation in the context of Airbnb does indeed fall within the scope of the National Ordinance Accommodation Guest Tax. Yes, it does. The next question, does the improvement of financial management of the country elucidate and substantiate within this government serve the interests of the people? MP, as you have mentioned before, I think you've indicated um, very well that um, the efforts that we have made as a government over the last three years, um, dealing with the financial statements, implementing the technology that we've had implemented, and the manner we've dealt with finances in general over the last three years have served the people well, and um, I think the people themselves are appreciative of this. In regard, <laughs> to the parliament building. We will be having a meeting with the chair of the committee in short for the, del for the delivery of the package and inform the committee of the next steps. In regards to the latest for ordering, there are many outdated laws, as you mentioned, MP. The Ministry of Finance has, put a, has started to put a committee together from different ministries to be able to identify dated um, ordinances to be able to bring them up to standards. MP Chanel Brownbill, he asks, who will do the job, who can do the job? And MP, I think that's very clear. We can do the job. We have been doing, doing the job, and we will continue to do the job.
Stefan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we have to switch laptops. Yes, we did miss a couple. MP Peterson. MP Peterson mentioned a travel budget going from uh, eight and a half thousand to sixty thousand dollars. Travel and hotel expenses were reduced or eliminated in the 2022 national budget due to national ordinance COVID-19 cuts. Nevertheless, this measure was not accepted by the Kingdom Council of Ministers. Gradually, we would like to bring this amount back to its historical value. And in addition to that, we have been following the scheduled meetings regarding the steering committee meetings, the World Bank meetings, IMF meetings, the spring and fall meetings, the bilateral meetings with the Central Bank in Curacao, and in Aruba, UPNA meetings, as well as travel to the Netherlands. Cabinet support staff also accompanies me at times. And the tax authorities are scheduled to attend the CIAT and the OECD meetings. The next question by MP Peterson was regarding the Davy Bay that was answered by General Affairs. The next question was in regards to why is there half a million budgeted again this year for the mortgage guarantee fund? Was this budget used last year? MP, I believe you have been looking at the incorrect version of the budget 2023, and I apologize for that. MP De Weaver also mentioned about the translation in the budget funds were diverted in the Budget Amendment 2022 to support the task force that I mentioned before that were dealing with the arrays of domain land and casino license fees. Yeah, so basically the money for the mortgage guarantee funds was put over to the task force um, MP. The next follow-up question was, did anyone see funds from it? And can we get a breakdown from this? No, anyone, no one saw fun, funds from it. And then there were some questions from MP Bushaida Martin from the other file. Which of, the th which of the third party contracts listed on pages 118 to 122 by law had to be our work put on public bid? According to the accountability ordinance on Article 47, Lit. 3 indicates that everything above 50,000 gillers for goods and services and everything above 150,000 gillers for works has to be put on public bid. In Article in Lit. 4, the same article indicates when one can deviate from a public bid. Next, in the first place, there seemed to be a redundancy in contracts and service offerings. Maybe the message clarify, MP said, maybe the message clarify that she wants to clarify. Secondly, the costs are to be cut, I believe, to fit contracts could be higher on the list. MP, there's no redundancy in contracts. We have an annual operation obligations, which may consist of SLAs or memberships or required services. The current and valid agreements are listed. Next question, has the government determined how it will address compensation of the budget deficits? Oh, I did answer this already in the other file. MP asks, can the minister provide the chairman of parliament an overview of how much is repaid on all of standing notes on a monthly basis? On page 115, the elucidation of, and page 68 of the catalog book, you can see that we will repay an uh, amount of 328.5 million gillers in loans this year. Of this total amount, 316.4 million is related to the liquidity support, for which we expect that we will get refinancing. The balance of that is 12.1 million gillers related to our loans. And regarding your question, and regarding the liquidity prognosis, I'll again refer 
to the quality implementation reports of 2023 through which a liquid prognosis for the year 2023 will be provided. These reports are sent to Parliament on a quality basis six weeks after the report has ended. <coughs> Next. Answer, Dementia Finance, the Finance Department, Section Section FEB sets the ceilings for all ministries. This is done based on historical figures taken into consideration, current commitment, and new policies. The ministry hereafter makes the budget letter where the ceilings are stipulated per ministry and several parameters that are to be considered when the budget is being prepared by the ministries. This budget letter is presented to and approved by Council of Ministers. After approval of Council of Ministers, this letter is shared with the rest of the organization and the meeting is held with the SGs and controllers of the ministries, where the letter then and the several templates and the parameters are presented and discussed. Next answer is regarding the SDGs, it means that the country packages, the SDGs, and the individual vision and mission of each ministry are reflected in the budget. In addition, the civil servants work together to see if the projects are in line with each other and where potential bottlenecks overlap. In this way, some process can be sped up and resources are used in the most beneficial way. Next question was regarding the fact sheet. Was answered already. Next question. Please explain in clear terms what the answer is to Article 73. MP, to answer your question on financial and other obligations of the government of the Netherlands under Article 73 of the UN Charter, it would be in essence to qualify the countries of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and to substantiate if St. Martin attained full measure of self governance or not. Once this conclusion is made, it is necessary to see how Article 73 of the UN Charter will apply and could be interpreted. For this, a larger discussion is needed. Mr. Chairman, I believe that were all the questions from MP Grisha Helga Martin and actually all of the MPs in general. So. Thank you, Minister, for your answers in the round one. I now go to the clarification, and I see MP Christopher Emanuel. MP Emanuel, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, getting right into the clarification, I asked the Minister the question concerning the new tax system, universal health care amongst country packages to be rolled out in 2023. Now, Mr. Chairman, in the paper it says that the new tax system is to be rolled out in 2023, which is this year. I don't care what Central Committee the Minister came to and gave whatever presentation. I asked for a detailed, detail, for it to be detailed and sent to us. That was not done. The minister says something about nothing is to be come out. In the paper, it says to be rolled out in 2023. What are those taxes? What are they? He, he said something. I asked for it to be detailed and please send to us. That's what, that's, that's what I ask, Mr. Chairman. In addition to that, I want a clarification on the amount that the minister said of the 16.3 that is directly given to the government, I believe he said six million or something like that. I would like that to be clarified if it's accurate. The six million is what is given directly to the government. I said he probably said something on the accounting, some central bank or something like that. I would like that to be clarified too as well. And also, Mr. Chairman, this is an actual size of the taxi number plate. This is the actual size of it. The minister probably can't see blind or whichever it is, use some other number plate. But this is an actual size of the taxi number plate. I didn't measure the number, the letters. I measured the numbers, the numbers. So I'm asking the minister to clarify if the taxis 
if this, if this is, is this is not accurate, if it's accurate or if it's not accurate in terms of the regulations, 527.5, this is an actual size. And there's a wrong two. So I can go and actually get the number plate and do the same thing, because that's what we did. That's what we did. So I'm asking if this is the actual size that it should be, between 5 and 7.5 and 4 millimeters in terms of the thickness. I have the ruler here. I did the measurements and everything. I didn't do the letters. I did the numbers. Now, Mr. Chairman, you know, it's unfortunate that the minister chose the course of action in terms of answering his questions. Even though Granham told me earlier that when Bryson walked over, MP Bryson to brace himself, he said it's okay, it's no problem. Leave him come and say what he wants to say. The thing is this, Mr. Chairman, and I said it's not a minister who have to brace himself, it's actually the MP who should brace himself. I actually thought that the meeting was going pretty well, but I, I am disturbed because I asked the minister questions pertaining to the tax office and nepotism going on in the tax office. The minister's course of action was to point the finger at me in terms of being related to nepotism and that I would know about it and I give this. Now, the thing is this, right? Not one judge, not two, but three. I was investigated up to the tilt. And all three of them made it known that nothing was done, that I did nothing wrong. What is wrong with asking for a quotation? I never, ever gave or uh, had a quotation given from no family member of mine, regardless to whether they live on the same property or the same address or wherever I live, never. But I'll tell you what is nepotism, Mr. Chairman. I hope the good minister know who's Miss Baptiste. That's his living girlfriend. Couldn't get her, her gratuity or whichever one it is to the tune of more than ten to 15,000 guilders. Now, you must say that this is not part of clarification, but that's what happens when you become personal. But there's a second round, Mr. Chairman. So I would give the minister the opportunity to apologize because there's a second round. And the thing is this, right? I was calm, I was cool, I didn't go at no one. I didn't say nothing. I stick to the article, and I stick to what is facts. The minister, Mr. Chairman, through you, chose to become personal. I hope he had time to listen to all the recordings that was played with MP Bryson. I hope. Because there's another MP in there who's on that tape as well. Make it mention which brothels they like to go to. I hope he had time to listen to all of them. But there's a second round. Since you want to become personal, then I would do the same thing too as well. I would just lay those clarifications on the things that I make mention of. Because again, this is the budget that we are debating. What did I do? Stick to things that's related to the budget. I didn't, make, I didn't ask no question that is outside of it. The 16 point something million euros, it's here in the paper. The new tax system and everything is here in the paper. The plates is, I asked the minister those questions. The minister is the one who was showing the plate and I said I like the design, it was good when it was chosen, all those things. Everyone is questioning the numbers. I asked about the regulation and everything. Those are the things I asked. I asked about nepotism going on in the tax office, not in the minister's cabinet. I didn't ask, no, nothing with the minister, nothing. Nothing. But when the minister used or chose to use his cheerleader to lobby, to lobby, to get what he want done, 
because he couldn't get it done for his girl. It's a different story. That's a different story. And that is what is called nepotism. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to leave it there because there's a wrong too. I thank you very much. Thank you, MP Christopher Emmanuel. The next person I have is MP Rolando Bryson. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to add the three clarifications. In response to the question regarding the acting positions of the head of tax, um, I would like the minister to maybe clarify a little bit because it might come across as if that's an okay situation. Whether it, uh, legally it's not or not, maybe more the minister to clarify, is that okay? Because one of the concerns I've had for a while and I've mentioned in parliament and to the minister is that you have the head of the tax office that is also the head of inspection. And the head of inspection is the head of audits that's supposed to be counterparts. Then you have the head of audits that's also the head of receivers. And the auditing department is supposed to be able to issue what the receivers are supposed to collect. So I really don't think that's a desirable situation. Maybe the minister can clarify that a little bit. And regarding the open vacancies, I know for sure um, one of the, a former staff member of the tax inspectorate, a tax inspector, had applied for that position uh, to become tax inspector and that did not materialize and the person ended up leaving the country and returning to Holland. Um, just if the minister can clarify about those vacancies, once someone isn't found, let's say this person, okay, was a, a Dutch person, um, but what happens then? Do they stay up on the website? Because when I go on the website of government on the vacancies, I no longer see them. Can they instead just be placed there and, and left there as open vacancies so that at least it's clear from the government that this is not a desirable situation and we're letting everyone know that these positions are still open because as I last checked uh, a moment ago on the St. Martin government slash employment page, I do not see those acting head positions at the tax inspectorate available. And as I mentioned, I don't think that is a very desirable situation. Those are my clarifications, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Bryson. The next person I have is MP Grisha Halika Martin. Soon to be good morning, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, good morning. Good, good morning. <laughs> it's very, I'm getting tired now. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, good evening to you. Good evening to the Minister of Finance and I'd like to, and good evening to my fellow colleagues, and I'd like to thank the Minister of Finance for answering just a few of my questions. Some he missed out. So I would like to ask a few and maybe seek clarity on some others. I have to put it on my phone, and, and um, so bear with me as I ask. One of the questions that I did not get from the Minister through you, Mr. Chairman, is, from the presentations by some of the individual members of the Council of Ministers, it was clear that they were forced to cut their budget by the Minister of Finance. Can the Minister explain how the budget preparation process goes exactly? Is it like in Holland, where the Minister of Finance sets the overall budget limits and parameters and then negotiations with, then negotiates with the other ministers in order to divide the available funds based on their needs. Then I had another question, Mr. Chairman, through you. To answer my question regarding the SDGs, the minister answered, and I quote, the country packages, the SDGs, the individual mission and vision of each ministry are lined up in the budget. Each engagement have their separate lines of escalations and due to our capacity, challenges, and most civil, serv most civil servants work on each engagement simultaneously, which eliminates silos and improves. I, I wasn't sure if that sentence was not finalized. I don't even understand what it means. So if I can receive clarity on that, Mr. Chairman, through you. And then um, I'm gonna ask for the third time. The third time, Mr. Chairman. And I hope this time it's clear. Prognosis, projections, what do you foresee the income will be in the future. Usually, accountants have that. They make projections. 
And I'm sure the minister, the fine minister himself, Mr. Chairman, had those for January and February. Can I at least have, I don't want to wait six weeks, Mr. Chairman, to see the ones from January and February. I am sure the minister has his projections for January 2023, February 2023, and March, I'm sure he has 2023. Can I please have that? It's not in the budget. These are his projections. What does he foresee in the future as income? That's a prognosis, Mr. Chairman. That's what I'm asking the minister. I'm going to ask it for the last time. I hope it's clear. I try to make this, I ask this question like three, four times again, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not getting the answers that I'm seeking. Uh, there's one more. Um, please bear with me, Mr. Chairman. Has the minister read the fact sheet on Article 73, commissioned by the Dutch Parliament? Why I'm asking that, because the fact sheet clearly states the three experts' advice on the um, finalization of the decolonization process. The minister stated on two occasions, because I heard that answer before, that there, there needs dialogue. They need to have a seat and discuss it. And I want to understand exactly what the minister means by that, Mr. Chairman. What steps are going to be taken to finalize the process? Is it going to be a work group? Is it going to be a, a, a project team? Um, who's going to dialogue when, how, what? Uh, let me see one more thing, if I'm clear. Uh, And what percentage of all our expenses consists of loan repayments? What percentage of all our expenses consists of loan repayments? I think that should be. I'll, I'll wait the clarity from the minister. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. I don't see any more clarification needed by any member of parliament. I look to my right if minister is ready right away or you need. The minister needs about five minutes. I'll give 10 minutes break. Meeting adjourned for 10 minutes. <laughs>
Good evening, good night, everyone. Welcome back to the continuation me public meeting. I now give the floor to Minister of Finance to ask uh, to answer the clarification questions. Minister of Finance, you have the floor. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, the question from MP Grisha Hadigan Martin was answered in the question from MP Pascal Williams, but I'll answer again for her specifically. How the budget process goes. The Ministry of Finance, the Finance Department section every day, sets the ceilings for our ministries. This is done based on historical figures taken into consideration, current commitment, and new policies. The ministry hereafter makes a budget letter where the scenes are stipulated per ministry and several, several parameters are, that are to be considered when the budget is being prepared by the ministries. This budget letter is then presented to and approved by the Council of Ministers. So all ministers have approved these parameters. After the approval from the Council of Ministers, this letter is shared with the rest of the organization and a meeting is held with the SGs and the controls for all the ministries where the letter, the several templates and the parameters are presented and discussed. Next, regarding the SDGs, please refer to my previous answer to your question. It means that the country packages, SDGs, and the individual vision and mission of East Ministry are reflected in the budget. In addition, the civil servants work together to see the projects are in line with each other and where the potential bottlenecks overlap may occur. In this way, some processes can be sped up and only resources are used in the most beneficial way. There are no SDGs, as I mentioned before, assigned to one particular ministry. MP keep asking for the prognosis, which is basically the future forecasting. Um, I have asked my staff to just give, in your explanation just now, you wanted January and February. So we just give the liquidity position of those two months. January, it was 31 million guilders. February was 42.48 million guilders. Has the minister read the fact sheet? No, not in its entirety. Repayment of loans, the answer is 328.5 million guilders has to be repaid this year, consistent of 316.4 million guilders which is related to the liquidity support received and 12.1 million dollars for other loans. MP Bryson. MP Bryson, your first answer, we will need to fill in the vacancies as this is indeed not desirable situation. The vacancies, your next question about the open vacancies, the vacancies will be Publish in short. And I'll go to the clarifications from MP Christoph Emanuel. The question was in regard to the new tax system, healthcare amongst the country packages to be rolled out in 2023, and some references that were in the paper. There is no list of new taxes. However, during my presentation on the improvement of the tax system with the Finance Committee of Parliament, February 8th and 23rd, 2023, to the proposals for the improvement of the tax system has been shared with the Finance Committee, and a copy can again be provided to the Parliament, which I will actually share again. The next steps are for the Tax Improvement Board Group to assess the fe feasibility of all proposed tax improvements and draft an advice for the Council of Ministers for approval. After the approval for the from the Council of Ministers, the tax improvements will be calculated by external experts and drafted in legislation and consultation sessions will be held with stakeholders before the actual concepts are submitted to Parliament for approval. It is my aim, as I mentioned before, to have this done, the first stage legislation is done and brought to Parliament sorry, to the Legal Affairs Department by third quarter of 2023. Another clarification regarding Central Bank, six million euros are on the Central Bank account and, and related to the Tewio project.
clarity regarding the taxi number plate. Regard to the taxi plate, I don't have that taxi plate with me, so we will measure and if, if deemed necessary, the Ministerial Regulation 2023 can and will be amended with retroactive as of January 1st, 2023. And the last clarifications for MP Christoph Emanuel. Um, first of all, to you, Mr. Chairman, I did not call anyone's name, but again, who the shoe fits, wear it according to the saying. Secondly, MP, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, to you, Mr. Chairman, um, the good MP has been making things personal um, to the Minister of Rummy <laughs> and to his significant persons, um, to myself, in radio, paper, in Parliament, and to the Prime Minister, Mr. Chairman. And second of all, Mr. Chairman, the Minister, the MP, mentioned that he didn't give any contracts to his family members. I'm willing to share any document, any documentation as with the members of parliament to see for themselves. Um, uh, the MP clearly stated about nepotism and I mentioned a minister that gave the contracts to the husband of his chief of staff. Again, never calling, MP, never calling anyone's name the MP decided to wear the shoe. And I also mentioned that it can be brought to Parliament and we could go through multiple ad advice if we want to. In this government, as I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the MP also mentioned round two, um, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to round two. I look forward to round two dealing with the people's business, Mr. Chairman, and I also believe I also believe that this government, we believe in ending these practices of the past. We believe in integrity, and we believe in ending corruption now. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Minister, for your answers to the clarification. I have MP Grisha Halligo Martin for one more clarification, I believe. MP Grisha Halika Martin, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me this brief clarification. I made a, a little mistake in my clarification. I asked the minister for the prognosis for January, February, but I meant I wanted for the entire year. See how easy it was for him to just give me January and February? I wanted for the entire year. This is a prognosis report. Government should have this. And lastly, I noticed I missed a question. Which SDG is um, assigned to the Minister of Finance and why? And um, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP, MP Grisha Halliger Martin. <coughs> Minister, you have. I think uh, MP Grisha Halliger Martin said if in writing you can send it to her, so please email it to the Parliament. I have asked to send it to the Parliament. I believe there's two questions and the next one you can answer now. Minister of Finance, you have the floor. Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, the prognosis will be sent in writing. In addition to the SGs, we did, I did answer that question. Um, in addition to the, the last part of that question, I did answer and said, there are no SDGs assigned to specific ministry or ministers. Thank you, Minister, for your answers to the round one questions and to clarifications also. We will now adjourn for three minutes for you to swap with the staff members for your position as Minister of Romi. Meeting adjourned for three minutes.
You ready? Good morning, St. Martin. Welcome back to the continuation of this public meeting number 16. We have Minister of Acting Minister of Romi, Mr. Ardwell Irion. Welcome to him and his support staff. Minister, you can dive into your answers right away. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll start with the questions posed by MP Grisha Halligan Martin. First question was in re reference to a town hall meeting that was held in Ebenezer. Which concrete actions will be undertaken following this meeting, if any, which entities will be involved? The minister did attend a, hall, a town hall meeting organized by the St. Martin Community Collective South Reward, to which the members of the Ebenezer Community Council were also invited. Their concerns in regard to street lights and road grills were noted. They were informed that the government is already in discussion with NVE GBE on the way forward regarding the street lights. When the working plan is in place, the residents will also be updated. As a ministry, we will follow up with NVGB to ensure these matters are addressed in a timely manner. Can the minister confirm that the 2023 draft budget has funds available to address the issues in Ebenezer? Yes. Will the minister consider doing a walkthrough within the, within the community of Ebenezer with the residents to see what other issues there are other than street lights? Yes, the minister is always open and has been open to meeting with the people of the community. Number four, acrobats. Will the minister be reading the presentation on acrobats? And will he be meeting with the company? We recently received a document and we will dissect and digest accordingly. What was the total amount for travel for the entire ministry of 2022? Travel to the various conferences total 33.839.62 guilders for the year 2022. These trips were for Aruba, Washington, D.C., Curacao, the Bahamas, and the Netherlands. Aruba was for cultural Minister, events. Minister, could you raise your mic up a little bit? For Aruba, it was cultural events as the Deputy Prime Minister. For Curacao, it was in relation to the Wastewater Conference. For the Netherlands, it was wastewater with the water to the life in Limburg and the recruitment fair for Vrami. For Bahamas, it was a high-level forum for the Caribbean water and waste. Next question, is it correct that the minister has no travel budget at all for 2023? How is he traveling? Can this be clarified? A budget amendment occurred to facilitate the travel expenses. Next, which SDGs are assigned to the minister? Sustainable development goals are not assigned to specific ministries. Some SDGs are aligned with the ministry in the execution of projects and the carrying out of key objectives as these are part of the National Development Plan. And I'll move on to questions posed by MP Rian Peterson. What is the current status of the over, over the bank project? As the outcome in the first instance is determined by the judge and not by the minister, any commentary as to the potential outcome of the case or the status of over bank is issue or the project would be irresponsible speculation at this time. In any case, the government would not want to hurt its procedural chances or to be accused of attempting to influence the judge by going into specifics on the ongoing lit litigation. It is for this reason, no further commentary can be provided at this moment. Next question, how many civil, server, how many civil works permits were issued? Since the reinstatement of Article 28 on April 26, the 2021, the Ministry of Brahmi has received 14 requests for demolition permits, 12 requests for infrastructure permits, and five requests for dredging permits. When did the Council of Ministers approve the advice for district cleaning? Come approve the advice for district cleaning on Thursday, March 16, 2023. Can we see the final awarded advice? The internal advice for awarding will be shared with Parliament via the confidential manner. I would also like to see the SOB report that was acquired by the minister. 
as well as the detailed voting from the committee for the district in 2022, 2025. The SLBA reports are in general not for external use, specific agreements are made. When was the announcement slide by the governor for the district cleaning sign? Can we get a copy of that? A national decree is not needed for projects that have been through a public tender that was budgeted for. Article 47 of the ordinance regulates when a public tender is required. In deviation from sub, in deviation from sub, as he mentioned, in deviation from subsection one, competitive bidding is not required if the projected expenditure of the amount of 50,000 gallons does not exceed, in this case, of the, per, of the purchase of the service of goods. B, the amount of 150,000 gallons does not exceed in the case of execution of works. Next question, what is the status regarding trenching? As mentioned during the CC meeting, the tender of trenches was supported by SOAB. The corresponding report was completed. This is in the final stages of approval and the contract should go into effect shortly. The trenches currently pose no threat and are cleared. Next, MP said, I want to see the composition of the entire committee. The appendices of this SOAB report on district cleaning 2022-2025 will be shared via the confidential route due to the sensitivity of the information, MP. What experience does the committee have with previous tenders? The committee members have varied experience with the tender procedures which were held at the Ministry of Rummy. Was the cabinet of Rummy or anyone in Rummy directly involved with SRB? No, there were no cabinet members that formed part of any evaluation committee. The department head of the Department of Infrastructure had the lead in discussions with SRB during the process. The report was written independently by SRB and shared with the ministry for its own internal awarding. Are the district cleaning bids for 2022 to 2025 on price or points? During the evaluation of a public tender, a, com a company received points based on the sub submitted information which is judged by the evaluation committee. District cleaning 2022 to 2025. Did one of the awarded contractors place on a complaint at the Ombudsman. The Ministry is not aware of any official complaints filed with the Ombudsman for District Clean 2022-2025. However, the Ministry recently received correspondence from two companies that participated in tender in which the Ombudsman was copied. What is the Minister's answer to the Ombudsman? The Ministry has been in contact with the Office of the Ombudsman regarding the pending cases and the Ministry is busy with the preparations for answering on the final report. Why did GB file a case against Aurora Tech? This answer, this question was sent to General Affairs for answering. A recent press release from the Ministry of Rummy regarding social housing stated that an MOU was signed between the Samaritan Housing Foundation and Rummy. How can the, how can the same parcel of land be issued twice for reference? This parcel of land has not being issued by the Samaritan Housing Development Foundation as yet. After a, review, after a review by the Department of Domain Affairs, it was found that a national decree was drafted and issued in July 2012, which the number is 2012-1228. In this decree, though, a long lease period of 60 years is mentioned. The entity was given, the entity was given a, and I believe the MP, you did not, you did mention the company's name, right? High Tech Development. Yes, High Tech Development Corporation, NV, was given a period of time to pass a notorial deed which did not take place. In addition to that, the document will be sent um, to Parliament. The next question was A, was High Tech Development and be approached by the Ministry concerning their decree? With no expiry date that they still have for issuance on the same parcel of land. During our current tenure, the ministry has not met with said company. And now move on to the questions posed by MP Ramu. Does the ministry have a portal or a way the residents can inform the ministry of car wrecks? The ministry does not have a portal at this time. However, any concerns relating to car wrecks can be sent via email to mainromi at samaritangov.org. 
Once received, this is shared with the relevant department for further handling within the car wreck project. Next question, MP Akim Arundel. How does the Mensa feel about the budget? The Mensa believes that the budget is, is realistic and we, and we need be amendments will be made. For too long, we have been dealing with budgets that did not properly reflect our actual situations. And I'll move on to the questions by MP Rolando Bryson. Does the improvement of the infrastructure such as roads and sewage that are budgeted, elucidated, and substantiated serve the interest of the people of St. Martin? The budgeted funds towards our main and side roads on the capital investment have been made with the best interest of St. Martin at the forefront. Our current infrastructure is beyond repair and patchwork can no longer suffice. So the resurfacing of our current roads and hard surfacing of the new roads is absolutely necessary. Parking in Phillipsburg. MP has a sincere concern for this. Parking has been a priority for the ministry and the government with the growth of the businesses in Phillipsburg over the years. The needed capacity for parking would have increased with approximately 25%, bring the parking capacity to a amount of 1,500 parking. In order for the Ministry of Government to structurally solve the parking in Phillipsburg, parking garages would have to be erected, at least four parking garages, with a capacity of five to 600 parking, totaling 2,000 to 2,400 parking would need to be available for Phillipsburg on a long-term basis. We have made the farm post office lot available to visitors to Phillipsburg, and we have seen the positive effects of this. Where are we regarding new plumbing building? A committee has been put in place in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and General Affairs. The lots are designated for development, for development of department building and government-owned offices. I now move on to the questions posed by MP, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. According to the law, there shall be a nature commission. Is there a nature commission? Currently, there is no nature commission. However, the Ministry of Romney will look into this and start discussing the installation of the nature commission as mentioned in the nature ordinance. How are the discussions regarding the Kobe Hill proceeding? The discussions are in very, the discussions are in a very early stage. We are not this was not a priority during the last two years. Coming out of, the, out of the pandemic, this has our attention, and the further updates can be provided once we come to a new agreement. And regarding the cemeteries in Kulasak, the regular upkeep of cemeteries is regulated by the means of District Clean 2022-2025. Contrast funding is regulated by means of the budget on the dist, dist, district and on the house. How close are we from having a road fund? What is the road, road network plan, if any? The creation of the road fund is now in the early stages. Our current infrastructure and financial situation serve as a clear indicator that we must put in place a sustainable method of managing road infrastructure and developing our road network. The Department of New Project has a no road network improvement plan prepared in the past known as the RNIP. In the RNIP, various links known as link three, six, two, and link four were identified including the upgrade of main roads and critical intersections. Last question by MP Westcott Williams. Where did the overlaying main roads come from in the budget? The ministry had has turned towards an improved concept of roads from the animal road patching, maintenance to road surfacing program. This comes from the annual operation budget from the Department of Infrastructure Management. And now I'll move on to the questions posed by MP Gums. Could the minister share and indicate the status of the request of, of the prosecutor and where it is currently. The ministry met with the OM along with the Women Roads to discuss the final proposal at hand and provide an update to the technical negotiations with the Women Roads. 
Currently, a written communication, including all the technical information, is being finalized to be sent to the OM and team. Approximately 75% of the total sum is remaining based on the works carried out by Raymond Rhodes. The technical team is currently assessing the cost of the previous project. Next question. Could the minister please provide a status update on the court cases? The government of St. Martin has hired a legal representative in the Netherlands to further handle this case, which is currently ongoing. Due to the sensitivity of this matter at the moment and not to influence the legal proceedings, government prefers not to indulge in any further into this matter. However, this is not negative. However, this does not negatively affect the commitment of government in regard to this project. Lastly, clarify what last communication received from the EU regarding the Dutch water project. The EU has requested government to inform them on our intentions for the Squatter project and government has committed to getting this, the remaining works done and ensuring there is a functional sewage system. The completion of the works in the Squatter remain a priority for the ministry and for the government. Mr. Chairman, that will be all the questions for the Ministry of Government. Thank you, Minister. I would now go into clarification, and I see MP Rion Peterson. MP Peterson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good night to, to good morning still. Good dia, Manson. To everybody still uh, tuned in. Mr. Chairman, just a clarification on um, the answer from the minister concerning the SOA Bay report. Um, I believe that um, it is pertinent that we actually receive said SOA Bay report, especially since it was paid for by government, um, which would mean that it was paid for by a budget approved by this parliament, and therefore I don't see any need why that information would be held confidential, even if it's for the INSAHA, because otherwise, um, why did the minister request it? So I do want to get that SOA Bay report, because um, you know we have a tendency in this parliament where we come with documents and you know that was criticized in the past therefore we want to ask you know officially for the report before you know numbers are getting thrown out of what companies got which points etc and then mr chairman um also i asked the minister specifically to you mr chairman um is the basing of the the district cleaning um of 2022 to 2025 was the bit based on price or points the answer that I received was that there is an evaluation committee, I believe, um, that was not my question. I asked if the last bid that was just decided upon by COM on Thursday, March 16, 2023, if that bid was given out by price or point, what, what was used and what, was, what came out out of the SOB report. So to clarify, did the companies who objectively scored highest in the same report that the SOB um, gave did those companies also objectively get those tenders awarded to them? Um, um, and as for the Buslight from High Tech Development Corporation, NV, um, I also have seen that Buslight, and I can confirm to you, Mr. Chairman, that there is no six month period for him to go to the notary in that Buslight. And that was the whole issue in the first place. And that'll be it for me for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Peterson. The next person I see is MP Grisha Harlego Martin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I just have a one clarification on the travel of the Minister of Rami. Last year, the budget of 2022 was zero. I am assuming we had an amendment. I'd like to know exactly how much the amendment was of last year for the travel. And the minister stated through you, Mr. Chairman, that the actuals for last year was 33,000, about 33.8 thousand guilders. The minister traveled Aruba, Washington, Curaçao, the Netherlands, and the Bahamas on a budget of 33.8 thousand guilders. Is that correct? And I'm not only looking at the minister himself, but also his staff. I'd like to know how much maybe the minister's staff also, how much how much was, um, what was the actual budget with that as well? And um, there's a budget amendment, he said, the minister stated, because in the, in the budget of um, 2023, it's zero. Uh, I, I don't know if I missed it in the nota that we received. I may have missed it. Uh, if we'd like to know exactly what the amendment amount is for 2023 for the minister of Rami travel. Thank you. Oh, and lastly, I have one question. 
maybe this ministry might be able to answer that question because it was not answered here, but maybe, I don't know if the ministry would know what SDG is assigned to the Minister of Romney and why. Thank you, Minister. Um, Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. The next person I see is MP Rolando Bryson. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in regards to my question about the, the parking lot, I don't know if the minister is able, and I, I know it's sometimes difficult with the processes that government has to go through in terms of being able to get projects approved, et cetera, but considering the importance that the minister pointed out in terms of a multi-level parking lot, or at least a multi-level parking lot. Can the minister give us some sort of, as close to a definitive answer as possible, that we can expect a multi-level parking lot in 2023 at some point? So at least that it would start, or a, a, a time frame, or something? Um, because many of our constituents, especially those in Phillipsburg, are looking forward to understanding if this is going to be an actual reality within 2023. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. I don't see any other MPs for clarification, so I would look to my right if the minister is ready to answer right away. Minister needs a five minutes break, and I will adjourn. I will adjourn for five minutes. Meeting adjourned.
morning and welcome back, Minister of Acting Minister of Romi. You have the floor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the questions posed by MP Peterson, the SRB, the SRB report, as I mentioned, um, typically are for external use, um, but we will be um, sending it in the confidential manner to Parliament for INZACA. Next question was, was it based on price or points? It was based on points, which I did mention before. Um, next question, answer is, during the evaluation of the public tender, a, co a company receives points based on the submitted information, which is then judged by the eval evaluation committee. Comments on the decree for high-tech development. I did share the decree with the MP during the break. Um, so we will then do some further investigation via the ministry. The MP did point out some other additional information, which we will, as I mentioned before, investigate. The next answer will be in regard to the highest awarded tender. This will be reviewed with the department and sent in writing. The next answer from MP Grisha Helido Martin regarding the uh, question relating to travel and support staff. The total for travel for the, of the cabinet was 14,437 guilders. And for the answer with the SDGs, which was answered, sustainable development goals are not assigned to specific ministries. Some SDGs are aligned with the ministry in the execution of projects and the carrying out of key objectives as part of the National Development Plan. Chairman, that's all the clarifications. Thank you, Minister. I see there's no more need for clarification. I would like to now adjourn. We have quorum. I would like to adjourn for the next minister to come in. Meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Good morning <coughs> and welcome back to the continuation of the public meeting number 16. A special welcome to the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, Mr. Rudolph Samuel and the support staff. Minister, you will be answering the round one questions posed by members of parliament and you have the floor. The mic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you and the Khrifir. Good morning to the members of Parliament. Good morning to my support staff here next to me and those in the ministry. And I would like to, at this moment, say a special thank you for those who are still up and are supporting the process of this budget. Good morning to those in the Tribune, to the media, and all the people of St. Martin. Mr. Chairman, if you look on the screen, you will see a picture of someone and they are decked out in American football uniform clothing. For those of you who didn't recognize the screen, number 83 is Minister Samuel. Mr. Chairman, the reason I went and looked for the picture is because earlier today, I heard members of parliament talking about how they love American football and making touchdowns. But American football, Mr. Chairman, when you look in the stands and you see touchdowns being made, they look easy. But to make a touchdown in that game isn't easy. It takes a lot of work and you take a lot of blows. That's why we all pat it up. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to go over to the questions and answers posed by the members of parliament. The first question, Mr. Chairman, is from the member of parliament, Westcott Williams. Question, Minister, can you provide a list of your predecessors? And yes, the first one, Dr. Rhoda Arundel, that is in 2010. And then we get Ms. Silveria Jacob, our present PM, and then Mrs. Patricia Lawrence Phillips, and then Ms. Rita Barn Gums, next Ms. Silveria Jacob followed again by Ms. Silveria Jacob. The seventh was Ms. Eureen Walter. And then we had number eight, Mr. Wycliffe Smith. And the number nine was Mr. Adrian Artwell. And number 10 is Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel. And that if you look back, you would see also the cabinets in that formation. The second question, in December 2020, Minister said that the monument fund was almost completed. You also talk about archeology span policy being drafted at the time. And Minister, what about the efforts to buy back Fort Amsterdam? Indeed, Mr. Chairman, and in 2020, we did talk about, about the policy about the, 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 the completion of the fund was nearly done because we, what we did at that time, we had chosen SOA Bay to do the job, but we were sent back and had to start all over again. And then what we have explained to parliament is that something went wrong with the process and then we have to go over again. As it relates to the underwater archaeology, 
The work continues specifically in the collaboration with Dr. Mr. Tim Timmers, who is a legislative specialist secured through the field on the overleg platform. And Mr. Chairman, when it comes to Fort Amsterdam, indeed, I would really love to buy it back for the people of St. Martin. But I would not make a commitment like that without knowing if I can really get it happen. So it is something that I would like to do, but I did not remember myself saying I am working on it. The Monument Fund, given my introduction to the minister's statement in 2020, apparently the standard documents were prepared for the bidding process. Can the documents be shared? No, the documents cannot be shared because they are active documents, they're not finished. In January 2009, St. Martin and the Netherlands signed an agreement regarding monument care on St. Martin. It was signed by the then, by the deceased Ray Malin and former Minister Plasterek, the Prime Minister and her discussions regarding slavery, reparation awareness, awakening. Can we go back to that kind of understanding, the understanding of funding for things that matter to the people of St. Martin, such as monument care? Can we not get back to the point to talk about things that matter to us as part of our heritage? We need a paradigm shift. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I agree. Ministers, as ministers, these are all pertinent matters. And the ministry is dedicated to the dialogue of what matters to the people of St. Martin. This morning, observation that we had on the Marigot Hill of the Treaty of Concordia was such an event. Extensive multi-annual monu monument policy slash plan from 2009 with information regarding the country and the heritage. What is the status? I can remember this question in the past and in the past we did explain that parts of the policy is being pulled forward and is being worked on. And when we are finished with the whole policy, we would come to a holistic document. So we are still busy with that policy. Education and the funding for our school boards. Why is there a difference in the budget provided for USM 2022 and when it was cut? Um, that budget was cut in 2023, that is the question. Have these schools submitted a budget that is outside of the norm? The same identical question was asked in the Central Committee and the answer given then was that the funding for education to the subsidized school boards and the USM has not been cut. So the following question also regarding NEPA would have the same answer. The, the funding for the school boards, including NEPA, have not been cut. And if need be, amendments will be done during 2023, if need be. Court case by Protestant school board in Curacao against government. The courts condemned the government of Curacao to adjust the tariffs and norms to allow a, that particular funding to provide the education that deemed necessary. That what it shares, it states that the verdict of the court, and so if we discriminately are cutting budgets for school boards, what and how long would it take for a school board here to undertake similar action? Mr. Chairman, any school board can take government to court regarding the height of funding awarded. However, the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports would not have a similar outcome in court considering that the funding of education to primary, secondary, advanced secondary education is based on a legal framework that outlines objectives, norms for funding. 
laptops for schools slash children students. Are these laptops for the schools? Is it still based on the research that was done for the 360 something students? I believe and I will be provided to the, I believe and will be provided to students or will it be like how it was done in the primary schools and be provided? Mr. Chairman, the laptops that have been bought indeed was bought from the system, the research that we did back then. It took a while and I would like the members of parliament to know that all the laptops for students will be given to the schools and then the schools will be responsible for them. And the laptops that would be given to the teachers would be given to the teachers most naturally with an agreement and the staff of the DPE schools. Can the minister explain better the issue of the community schools? Which way, which by the way was stated by several predecessors of the minister. The community schools project started in 2007, 2008 through funding from USONA's poverty alleviation project. It entailed partnering with school boards to house five community schools, which are commonly known as after school activities for vulnerable children. The four elementary subsidized schools school boards, including public education, obtained funding to execute the community concept model in one school, which amount to five schools. Since then, two subsidized school boards, with the use of their subsidy, expanded the community school concept in all of their schools. Therefore, to answer your question, our 2023 budget of 1,231,321 guilders is used for 10 schools related to four subsidized elementary school boards and public education. Currently, the amount made available for subsidy is based on the 100 students per foundation per year. The maximum amount related to that per school board for the year 2023 is 246,264 guilders. Mr. Chairman, the following question, the cinema ordinance. Minister mentioned that he is doing a review. What is the objective of your review? Are you looking at cinemas, movies, etc., in general, or are you looking at how some additional money can be had? So what is your objective? Ultimately, Minister, Mr. Chairman, the review is to optimize and improve the overall functioning of the Film Curating Committee. The following question, MOU, AUC, and government. MP thinks she heard the minister mention an amount of eight students. Is that amount of eight are on the basis of the memorandum that AUC has with government, in which AUC has accepted to grant scholarships to St. Martin students? Yes, that is correct. All students attending AUC are exempted from paying any tuition fees, approximately 25,000 per semester. An academic year consists of three semesters based on the MOU. The government of St. Martin still provides funding to cover the students' living and miscellaneous expenses. The following question. Hence the question as to whether there is a policy on medical schools. Mr. Chairman, the draft law on higher education seeks to regulate all higher education programs delivered on St. Martin, including medical schools. In anticipation of the ratification of the law, the Ministry of ECYS has contracted a consultant to support the process of establishing a framework for the accreditation of higher education programs. The Ministry also has a draft framework for medical schools 
that is used to guide the establishment of medical schools in the absence of a policy on, and a higher education ordinance. Vaping. Minister consider this so important that it has been made a multi-ministerial project. Can I have a copy of the decision of the multi-ministerial approach to deal with vaping? If that decree exists already, can I have that? Mr. Mr. Chairman, the decree does not exist. And why not is because while looking at the topic, I have discussed it preliminary with my, my colleagues and we have agreed to do a multi-ministerial approach. Who would be the leader? We will discuss that when we come together and the organization also come together from each ministry. Minister ECYS in particular, your ministry has some projects. Your ministry projects under the capital budget of government. Are these projects ready to go? Mr. Chairman, there are various projects. And as I mentioned in the Central Committee, all the projects are in different stages of development. So the project in regards to the John Lamini Center, that project would need a terms of reference to be established in order to move forward. The sports related project is ready to go. The capital investment project to update DPE are as follows, Prince William Alexander School phase one. Um, the investment, yes. The Prince William Alexander School phase one, there are still discussions ongoing with the collaborators on how we will move forward, but that is pretty much ready to go. As the covering of as to the covering of Dr. Martin Luther King School, the playground, the gazebo, the technical drawings have just been completed, so we are moving forward with that. The network upgrade and ICT, the terms of reference have been prepared, and these projects will be done via a public tender. The preparation phase for the renovations of works at the NIPA is ready to go, and the tracking software for busing is ongoing. Then we get the question from Member of Parliament, Grisha Martin, which of the SDGs are assigned to your ministry? SDG four, sustainable development goal number four, which focusing, focuses on education and aims to ensure inclusive and adequ adequate quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Then we get the question from MP Emmanuel, where he spoke about the school bus. The answer in the book is correct. And Mr. Chairman, the answer in the book indicates that you would have to pass in the back of the bus. However, we do things in St. Martin and we do them so often and so long that we think they are normal. So I want to say that putting the bus slanted across the road is something that the bus drivers do because they feel that they are protecting the children. And then they ask the kids, the students to walk in front. And Mr. Chairman, if a bus stops by the pedestrian crossing, it is the pedestrian crossing you will go over. But under normal circumstances, the book is correct, you pass in the back. Then Mr. Chairman, we come to the questions of MP Gomes. Mr. Chairman, education agenda is constantly evolving and changing. So I'd imagine having the division responsible for managing our public schools to be more efficient when responding to these shifts, to these shifts would like make sense. The Central Committee meeting about this budget, you kind of hinted at being in favor of DPE carrying out a little more autonomy and responsibility for handling 
its finances when it came to necessary purchases for schools. So I'd like to know what specifically are the ministry's current plan to make the division more autonomous in handling its own finances where it pertains to those emergency sort of purchases. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, there are decisions on the table to make the division public education more distant from government and as independent as we can make it. However, in the process, as I indicated, I have engaged the services of SORB to help and determine the most effective way to have this happen. I have also said that my preference from what I have seen is that DPE, even though we are busy with the process, should be more financially independent. And that has to do with certain things that happens at the school, um, the process to get money to do those, to repair a broken pipe or a broken toilet those processes are too cumbersome and they take long. And if we can get the schools more in financially independent that these type of things can go fast, I think it will help in, in, in operating the schools more easily. Additionally, through you, Mr. Chairman, the Central Committee meeting, I ask about the statement that upgrades was to be done for ICT infrastructure at the public schools and how and when this work would be executed. The work will be done in-house and what cannot be done in-house will be tendered. That's the way to go. The minister stated that firstly would it seems to work that can be done in-house, then if not, it might be tendered. So to you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister, how many persons does the minister have in house that can perform the necessary activities? We have two coordinators that can do so, and the work that they cannot do will be tendered out. Has the minister considered tendering a multi-year agreement with a company to provide local support? Yes, minister have thought about this. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, through you to the minister, you highlighted ICT CapEx item for ICT for software and hardware, approximately 766,000 guilders. And your presentation made it seem as though that this was primarily strictly for school bus tracking system and the public transportation travel pass. So I'm assuming that this is a one-time fee for upgrades. However, I wanted to ask the minister if the funds here are located, um, if they for any new license fees. The 766,000 guilders is not only for the school transportation management system, but includes the network upgrades and hardware for the public schools. Regarding the investment in the school transportation management system, this investment covers the cost for the equipment installation and licenses for one year. The annual subscription cost will be 40,000 guilders. And the minister, and Minister Samuel, your presentation went a little faster than I used, than it usually, so I might have missed it. But are the improvements to the Raul Sports LH complex solely for the sport field, or do we also include the bleachers? The capex is for the field, and the bleachers have been brought under the project of the NRPB. Then we come to the question of MP Ludmila Duncan. Is the policy approach clear? What are the outcomes that the government is expecting from each sector, education, sports, culture? What are the specific approaches and are they measurable? In the explanatory notes to the budget, 
2023, Appendix 2, Bijlage 2, each ministry's policy plan for 2023 is detailed. The following question that was posed to all ministers. What are the levels of toxicity in the ministries right now in government? How toxic are they? What are the ministers doing in terms of very specific programs? Are they asking the employees about working in government? People, people are namely at the center of everything that is being done in government. Mr. Chairman, I would like to answer to the Member of Parliament. Um, in terms of levels of toxicity, toxicity, I don't know. Um, there can always be challenges in an organization. MP makes mention that the curriculum is outdated. MP questions whether the quality of education has, been, has improved since the minister took office. That is a question that the MP wants to know. Have the relationship with school boards improved? Have the quality of the lives of our teachers improved since minister took office? The Ministry of Education, Culture and Sports holds general school board meeting on a monthly basis. During these meetings, the school boards and the different di divisions and departments of the ministry have an opportunity to discuss a variety of matters like updates and current affairs, presentations on draft legislations and policy with the request for feedback, input and buy-in from the school boards. And presentations from third parties that are of the interest of the boards and the ministry. Several meetings with the minister and the school boards were also called to discuss present matters at the request of the minister as well as the school boards. The Department of Education has also assigned a staff member to be the first line of contact for school boards which has improved the lines of communication between the school board and the department. The government of St. Martin efforts to improve the quality of education on St. Martin is focused on two prongs. Firstly, putting in place the required legislation and policies to enhance the quality of education. These initiatives include working towards the establishment of the law on education supervision and delegated legislation to provide the legal framework for monitoring and enhancing the delivery of education at all levels. The establishment of the special needs policy to provide the required support for students with special education needs. The establishment of the legal framework for the delivery of higher education, the funding of higher education and the establishment of a framework for the accreditation of higher education programs. Conducting research regarding the career line of education professionals to inform recommendations related to the review of the function book and compensations of education professionals improve disaster management, conducting of research to inform a literacy and numeracy strategy, and the implementation of a standard assessment into the primary and secondary education cycle to support early interventions and remediation where necessary and inform policy development. Secondly, through investing in students, educational professionals, educational material, information system, and education infrastructure. These initiatives include implementation of the National Summer School Program, hiring of remedial teachers in public schools, funding of facilities 
funding and facilitating professional development program towards the continuous upgrading of education professionals. Renewing the national decree for the funding of education towards introducing required adjustment for improved funding of primary, secondary, and advanced vocational education, facilitating the repair and reconstruction of education infrastructure in collaboration with the NRPB and the Trust Fund, the development of a ministry management information system to enhance the availability of timely accurate data on the education system to inform policy development, investment into ICT hardware and software in the island's public school to enhance educational performance through digitalization projects, including the implementation of student information management system. As the MP correctly stated, changes in education take time and the impact of those changes also take time. However, it is anticipated that the initiatives detailed above, which are pursued during the last three years, will positively impact the quality of education in St. Martin and improve the lives of education professionals, including teachers. Mr. Chairman, in the years being Minister of Education, which is only about three on the 28th of March, I have heard members of parliament indicate over and over their love and passion for education. I have heard so many I have heard some say to me, um, I have been in the Ministry of Education and why haven't you done this and why haven't you done that? I thought, Mr. Chairman, bringing a law to Parliament, like the law on higher education, is a great achievement. The supervision on compulsory education law is also completed, also an achievement, also improves education because you're laying the foundation on which others will build. The policy for special needs, Mr. Chairman, is in a stage where it has never been before. Public school being provided with remedial teachers, each public school provided with a remedial teacher in order to help our students was not there. The national summer school program, also new to us. I understand the payment and the finish, the payment of the teachers, which I will get done, is taking some time. But the National Summer School Program that was brought forward in order to help our students will improve education. The, the professional development program that is in place, Mr. Chairman, to help the teachers and to educate them and to bring them up to par will also improve education. Mr. Chairman, Former Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister Gibson, put one million guilders on the table in order to establish a law school on St. Martin. When I came as minister, I made sure that that continued. Next to that, Mr. Chairman, we have also started the pre-law program. The pre-law program that helps those who want to go and study law come up to the level so that they can be able to do the studying of law. Buying of 140 digital boards, one for every classroom in public education, 
to bring at least public education up to par with what I have seen out there, Mr. Chairman, will improve education. Mr. Chairman, I have came to the ministry and I can remember going to Orania School and meeting a curtain for a door by the teacher's bathroom. And then I heard a person tell me, I am, I am in education a long time and I'm passionate about education. I met, Mr. Chairman, leaks in schools for seven years that I stopped. The playground at St. Martin's Vocational School that have always been wet, I have been told for more than 10 years, ain't wet anymore, Mr. Chairman. The new wing by St. Martin Vocational Training School that I met close and grown up with grass, Mr. Chairman, is in use. Mr. Chairman, one of the things that you could have seen on Facebook regularly about public school is that public school teachers were asking for toilet paper and, you know, amenities. Not during my watch. And so, as I can continue, Mr. Chairman, When you want to score a touchdown, you got to work hard. You have to work hard. And Mr. Chairman, um, I showed the picture of the lights for Coastal Lake Ballpark. Since Irma, it had those in the ministry before me, they were not bought. St. Martin have never had its own boxing ring. Minister Samuel have paid for it and it is ordered. We always used to order from the French side. Mr. Chairman, as I say, I'm going to leave this here because we have to try and get through. But Mr. Chairman, just to remember, in American football, you need to pad up because your opponent is hit. I will hold the rest in case I need it. The following question, digital thesis library. MP stressed the importance of such a library. She submitted a proposal internally for the establishment of digital thesis library some months ago. These thesis, thesis slash dissertation is part of completing tertiary education. Good research is being done by these students, but nothing is being done with these policy solutions for St. Martin. This scientific research can be used to provide solution to our problems. Reference is made to a journal article which was released entitled Across National, Across National Study on the Lessons substance abuse, intentions, pure substance, and parent-adolescence communication. The research compares both alcohol and cannabis use among adolescents, both here in St. Martin and the Netherlands. Is the minister or the ministry aware of this research? Have they read it? What is the ministry doing about substance abuse problem in our schools? Have we have a substance abuse problem on St. Martin? that all of us know about, I agree. Is the ministry in communication with schools? Yes, and if yes, what are the outcomes that they expect? What are you trying to solve? 
the ministry is aware of Dr. Dufu's, um, that he was conducting a research related to substance abuse. However, the ministry has not yet obtained and reviewed the report. What are we doing? One of the things I did was discuss a program project initiative where we first talk to the teachers or to train the teachers and those who are responsible for the students to be able to recognize when something is wrong with the students. And then the second step would be referral and most naturally the third step would be treatment. Following question, mental health. What is the minister's reaction to the call by young people, teen times in particular, for more attention to treatments and interventions as it concerns to mental health, mental illness in school? Care teams are installed in schools to provide support to students who are having challenges. All care teams include a social worker and or a counselor. Students are referred to the care teams by their teachers and students. And students can seek support themselves and go to their school counselor slash social worker. As such, schools work on interventions for students and programming based on the specific needs of their students. Ultimately, School boards are the competent authority. Many of our secondary schools have their own internal guiding system and employ a psychologist and or have arrangements in place to refer their students to an organization for such. Where this does not exist, the Student Support Services Division is a referral point for those schools and has been providing direct support to students referred including mental health and psychological support. This is at the core of the services of SSSD to students referred and interventions take place daily. The SSSD also work preventatively through support groups, workshops, training, and provisions of resources to aid teachers and our teams. Naturally, the ministry has a responsibility and we do intervene via SSSD. The intervention of SSSD involves working holistically in as such as that is possible and confidentially. However, it is important to note that wellness and mental health are the responsibility of us all. Mr. Chairman, the question, what is the impact of the cuts to the BUP program, will it reduce the amount of students that will be allowed to work at government? What is the impact of the cuts? MP would like to hear more. The 2022 budget was amended, and in particular, the budget account BUP. 43489 was increased from 75,000 to 125,000. This was done due to the fact that the request for accruals over Haveling funds to, to a suspense account was not approved. In order to accommodate the increase by program for 2022, a one-time budget amendment was submitted um, to budget neutral shift. Um, the 2023 budget was set based on based on the original budgeted amount for the book, which has been 75,000 since 2017. Consequently, the BUP program will cater to the original amount of students prior to 2022. The cut in the cultural tangible heritage post, the cuts were warranted. However, in the presentation of the minister, one of the policy priorities for 2023 included to protect and to promote 
national tangible and intangible cultural heritage, and a strong shared cultural identity. So it's a big priority. It was one of the three priorities for the ministry. However, again, when the cuts were elucidated, you don't understand the impact and you don't get a sense that that particular post or the department was or was or was and who fought or didn't fought. Mr. Chairman, we did object to cuts. However, the reality is that we want to also achieve a balanced budget and this requires sacrifice across the board. The MP does not hear creative ways in which the departments can do their work, only hear capacity issues, but no way in which capacity is being sought in particular this ministry. There is no plan or no program to assist those physically in the ministry to achieve the goals that they have set out themselves, the actual work. Capacity issues are a reality, Mr. Chairman. Opportunities for additional capacity, for example, through the country packages, trust fund capacity, and trust fund capacity we embrace. We also have internships. In regards to a plan to assist to achieve our goals, um, an internal assessment started on the critical success factors that include capacity building, needs for which I look forward to the recommendations. The following question, Mr. Chairman. MP would like to ask Minister to articulate exactly how the ministry aims to provide and protect natural, tangible, and intangible cultural heritage and a strong shared cultural identity in 2023 as per the priority that the minister mentioned. Among some of the plans are included in the following. The tangible cultural heritage, tracking cultural goods, intangible cultural heritage, I remember intangible cultural heritage um, campaign, promoting cultural culture nationally. These are all plans that include as the question asks, promote and protect. Special needs. There is an increase in special needs students in schools. There is a need, but also a demand that government act. Is the ministry making special needs a priority? The policy is being worked on for quite some time and supposed to be ready this year. We are not hearing a specific training program for staff. We are not hearing communication between the Ministry of ECYS and VSA to support therapists that also support teachers in special needs. In addition to the policy, what else is being done? We are not hearing that the current facilities the current schools that cater to the needs of special needs children are being equipped with the resources that they need. MP requesting clarity on the very specific things. What else is happening in addition to the policy? Mr. Chairman, Special needs education is a priority for the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports. And I want to say, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that it is a priority since I reach. Because indeed, when I look at the documents that I met, I can see that work was being done. But at some point in time, the work halted and at times, it halted so long that some of the work had to be redone. In order to get the things 
that we need that will benefit our special needs, the policy needs to be finished. The policy needs to be ready. And then based on the policy, we can then begin with the implementation in such a way that everyone would know what they can demand. So when I read that special needs schools require safe, accessible, and comfortable facilities, wheelchair ramps, wide doorways, sensory rooms, and quiet spaces for students who need a break from stimulation. When I read, we have one elementary school, special needs school right now, the Prince William Alexander School. Does the Prince William Alexander School have a sensory room or a quiet room for students? We know that the school is being built that in 2020, the ministry commissioned a design criteria report that would entail the requirements to accommodate students in those classrooms. Has the report been used to accommodate the students right now in special needs classroom? What is being done right now? We have students now that in need that that, in, that are in need of that kind of support, and can Parliament get a copy of the design criteria report? I believe so. What elements are needed for students with special needs to be successful, and what elements are present right now at the Alma Fleming campus and the St. Martin Vocational School? In regards to the sensory room, that is a question that I too posed, and I asked, why don't we do it now? And then I am told that we should wait until we reach to the other location. But I know the other location is taking so long, so why don't we do that now? I know when we were busy with the system at Lawrence School, and we spoke about inclusive school and school for special needs, we had to redo the drawings and make sure that ramps was put in, and especially for the system Mary Lawrence School, we put in a elevator because we took into consideration special needs students. And St. Martin needs to know that the special needs ch children, students, ones in our society, are getting the attention that they need. Even before I was in this position, I came across a lot of mothers who indicated the kind of problems they have and challenges that they have with their children. And some of them had to leave St. Martin to get the real care for their children. Mr. Chairman, knowing all of this, I would not sit in this position and not do what I have to do in order to help those students. So indeed, one of the things that I ask the ministry to, 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 to prioritize, to push, to get done, is the special needs policy. Also the training of teachers, or retraining of teachers, or upgrading the training of teachers to be able to work with our special needs is something that I also have asked for. Mr. Chairman, the situational, the situation analysis um, which was done on the island indicated, if I am correct, some 18 types of special needs. It's a very interesting research. Very interesting. But it is used, and it is being used to complete the policy. And when the policy is done, Mr. Chairman, I have already indicated we are going to have to look for the money to do the funding of taking care of our special needs in the way that it's supposed to be done. Another question. Another critical need is staff. 
who are trained, we just spoke about, who feel comfortable, who know what they are doing, who have all the tools necessary to assist these students, the therapist as well on St. Martin. We only have a few speech therapists, occupational therapists. Um, are they being supported and how? Mr. Chairman, here too, I can go into the details over and over. But once we know the need and we are making sure that we do what we have to do, but Mr. Chairman, not at Hockley, not at Hockley. And that is the difference here. Maybe, maybe Mr. Chairman, it would be nice if you say, okay, good, we're going to do this now today and then we do that now tomorrow. And when you're done, the foundation is not laid. But what I am doing is to make sure that the foundation is laid. And when that foundation is there, whether Minister Samuel or any other minister come, or the, the foundation will be there, that won't move. So training of staff is also the responsibility of the employer of each staff member. And as a ministry, we do have a responsibility to ensure that staff that we hire are trained. The SSSD supports the honing of the skills of care professionals in schools through its general care management meetings, which serve as a training platform for the care teams. SSSD has also conducted workshops and training sessions for care teams to hone their skills to address the needs of their students. The training of speech therapists and occupational therapists who are self-employed and or employed by a school board are not the responsibility of MECIs. All clients referred to, to SSSD are being supported by at least two professionals on the SSSD team. In some cases, SSD staff go to the schools to meet with clients and clients also go to SSSD office for sessions. Students are supported in that there is an intervention plan that is put in place for every student after the student has been assessed and what intervention plan outlines the support that the student will be given based on the, present, the presenting problem. The planning for these students also involves the school, parents, and any other professional working with the student. Care teams provide direct support to teachers and further support is also provided by SSSD. This support is through tools, resources, and training. It is important to note that the specific support would differ depending on the student and the presenting problem. It is not a one size fit all scenario. Following question. The, teacher, the, the issue of teacher burnout and ensuring that educators have access to the necessary resources to support and maintain their own mental and emotional well-being. Mr. Chairman, one of the programs that was instituted in public education lately was a pro is a program that enables the teacher, when the report card is ready, to just press a button and print all of the reports. Previously, a teacher would have to sit and write each one of those report cards by hand, one for one for one for one. Mr. Chairman, when, when we make these type of tools available for teachers, we are actually reducing the workload and the stress. Teacher well-being programs currently taking place provide teachers with information and tools to address their own well-being. Teachers also receive a handbook to further guide this process. Part of this program 
also involves a pre and post burnout assessment. Teachers will receive their results and can proceed with receiving further support privately through referral from their family doctor. There are also cases where the SSSD may recommend to a school board that an employee assistant program be put in place to address teacher burnout at their school or schools. There are, there are not events put programs but are currently taking place. The assessment is that is that part of the program that is important because we talk about teacher burnout without the necessary data so that targeted programs can be put in place by the school boards. Currently, it is difficult to speak about budgets as teachers' well-being is primarily responsibility of the employer. As the employer of public education though, I await the guidance of SSSD and proposals from the Division of Public Education as it pertains to programs to be introduced. I do not know if we can cost teacher morale at this time as the improvement of teacher morale is key. Other programs will come forth in 2024 budget. Daycare. Daycare and the high cost. MP strongly believes that early childhood education needs to be subsidized by government. There is a huge need to regulate the sector, in particular early childhood education. If government were to subsidize early childhood education, it would ensure that the learning gap with lower income will be closed. In 2022, a proposal entitled Development of a Sustainable and Equitable Funding Model for the Care School Program was presented after a request from government to UNICEF Netherlands. Not only a funding model, but also a data management system would be developed in centers and after school programs. Conclusion, the report are read by the MP. MP acknowledges the daycare association is doing its best they can. What is the philosophy of the Minister of Education and the Ministry on the financing of early childhood education? Mr. Chairman, MP says, MP acknowledges the daycare association is doing its best that they can. But the MP does not acknowledge that the daycare association is doing this work or having this being done or the ministry is guiding the process. That's what's happening here, Mr. Chairman. So the MP would like to know from the minister since the report was completed, what the decisions were as a, res as a response to the proposals in the report very needed to be very specific, specific. Action is needed now. The report also proposed the creation of a public-private partnership to share the costs. And MP suggests speaking to companies, they have corporate social responsibility. It takes all of us to see a difference in our society. Has the ministry ever had discussions with an St. Martin largest corporation or companies on public-private partnerships? What are those discussions, and if any, um, what were the outcomes of these discussions? Is it time now to establish a stable model for daycare's required a systematic approach? Indeed, Mr. Chairman, I agree. And when we talk about daycare, we are talking about those students from zero to three or zero to four. And Mr. Chairman, um, I will do my best. The amount of work that we are doing with this group 
indeed. And I really applaud the Department of Youth for the work that they are doing in order to upgrade that sector. I agree that some type of funding is needed. And we have, we have talked about this. We have talked about funding the teachers better. We have talked about funding the programs better. And the study is still ongoing. No final decision as yet, but we are looking into this. I've seen the different programs that have taken place with the early childhood developing, development um, organization. The training of the, the, of, of, of the staff, the training of the organizations, and how to better take care of our youngsters. All of this is taking place. There is an agreement between the Ministry of Education and the American University of the Caribbean for local students in medicine there. MP knows about at least two students. Are these local doctors guaranteed work in their own country? Is there communication and collaboration between the ministries of ASI and ECYS regarding these eight students who will become doctors soon? Will they have a place in St. Martin to do their practice, especially when they are in dire need of doctors? Students are getting scholarships, but will they be guaranteed work like former doctors who could not set up in St. Martin? Mr. Chairman, because all medical professionals seeking establishment in St. Martin are required to meet the national qualification, is why I have to say that depends. The USM Bachelor of Arts in Social Work via the UVI at USM partnership, um, is it the intention to include social work on the study financing priority list. Mr. Chairman here, I would like to indicate that based on the current policy to promote studying um, at our local institutions, study financing and or allowances are awarded to pursue all areas of study offered both by USM and NEPA, all including the social work. Student success in the Netherlands. There was a study on that, that is true. Because it was noticed that many of our students did not complete their studies, especially Caribbean students. And the study wanted to know what was wrong and what we can do in order to assist the students in making sure that they would be able to graduate and be successful in their studies. And the question is that the budget on Yet on the budget is an increase of 50,000 guilders for the upgrading of financing database. MP would like to understand what exactly is the database? What is the database that, what is the data that the database compiles and manages? Who manages the data? What is the upgrade for? And what is the information and the department has specifically on our students. Would also like to know what is the communication between division and students abroad. When there is a research done on all the islands, data on St. Martin is always limited. MP would like to understand what is happening at the study financing division, not department especially as it concerns data management. The answer, division study financing is an executing agency tasked with the execution of study financing legislation and policy. The Department of Education is the entity responsible for research and or data management within the ministry, Mr. Chairman. 
I would also like to say that the models require, the models that are required for, let me see how that goes. Yeah, so the study financing database administration and management system was developed to support the execution of the task and responsibility of DSF and consists of various models. So the applications, the recipients, the request, the payments, the statistics, the management. And Mr. Chairman, also guidance counseling reporting. And these models require consistent maintenance and upgrade existing models to ensure good functionality. The budget was increased because there was a price hike for the development, service, and hosting of the models. Question 17. A year ago, Parliament passed a motion on the state of sports. What is happening in sports? No report sent, no meeting. Mr. Chairman, I heard the MP and I checked, and indeed, there were a lot of documents sent, but that specific one on the state of the sports was not sent, and we sent it today. Following question, 110,000 was collect, collected from the one cent per liter on gasoline initiative. Where has the money been allocated, and has it been earmarked? It is going to sports. Yes, it is going to sports. MP asked the minister for a direct answer on that. The 110,000 guilders is in the budget, and it is to be put on a special account, a, not a special account, on a, on a budget post when the legislation is completed. The purpose for the funds derived from the one cent most not, is allocated, among other things, for sports. Has the minister moved education further? I believe I have demonstrated that. Heritage protection further, sports further. Did he provide the people, the people behind the policies, the people behind the programs, did he provide them with the tools and the resources that they need to be successful? Why can't the Ministry of Education be creative why high turnover at the ministry, high level of toxicity? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, yes. The ministry has progressed on various files. In 2022, in for education, and I mentioned some of these already, the development and implementation of the National Summer School Program, the finalization of the draft National Decree for Study Financing, the finalization of the mandate associated with supervision of compulsory education law, the draft law on higher education was approved by the Council of Ministers and presented to Parliament for ratification, the introduction of policy and implementation framework for standardized assessment in primary and secondary education. In culture, we have the fourth annual Creative Industry Forum, the Sage Cultural Awards, government decision to use the unity flag as a joint unity symbol of the affirmation of the unity and identity of the people of our island, work in progress with the dance department and stemming from the motion presented in parliament by F MP Westcott Williams was the promotion of dance for our youth. In the field of youth, the improved professional environment for the development of early childhood development, caregivers working with children under the age of four, increase the awareness of participation of our youth in the community, increase responsibility of our youth with regards to their own development and in sports in 2022 was achieved 
the sports scholarship, providing funding for facility management, maintenance and repairs, investment of 222,000 guilders for the development of sports facilities and the purchase of sports equipment, subsidized events participation, including local, regional, and international sporting events, highlighted athletes, sporting organization, events and achievements on government social media and platform, hosted a successful health and sport culture expo, highlighted legends in basketball and awarded persons in 11 different categories during our annual Brown Pelican Sports Award. Concerning the tools and resources needed, I am proud that the ministry team was able to achieve so much with the limited resources available and adjustments in the employment benefits. Then I come to the questions from Member of Parliament, Angelique Rumou. For the Division of Public Education Training for Public School Teachers as it relates to incorporating technology in education, the Minister, Minister mentioned... I would like to adjourn for three minutes, just to take a little break. Meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Good morning and welcome back. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I will continue with the questions of the Member of Parliament, Angelique Bumu. For the Division Public Education, training for public school teachers as it relates to incorporating technology in education, the Minister mentioned the introduction of a hybrid learning system where students spend at least half of their time learning online and the rest of their time learning in physical classrooms. Can the minister explain a bit more, a bit more, Mr. Chairman, about how the ministry envisioned this for public education? With the implementation, Mr. Chairman, of the smart boards, along with the learning management system, teachers now have the opportunities to adapt their teaching strategies. For example, above average children will be able to move ahead with a particular lesson after the teacher introduces the topic because there are additional activities available in the learning system, in the learning management system. Mr. Chairman, we do hope that the digital boards that are going to be introduced that will be here shortly will also provide the opportunity for students to log on from home and see the explanation of the teacher of what the teacher did earlier in the day. What will also be possible is that the teachers, which we all know, will also be provided with laptops can stay at home and prepare their lessons and send it to the board. And when they reach, they just need to touch the board and everything will be there ready. It is the intention to go further than that, to develop a portal for public education where students can log into the portal and they can see their lessons or go to certain sites or programs in order to help their development cognitively. What does it mean for practical school day in public education? A school day starts at 7.15 a.m. and ends at 12.50 p.m. for elementary and for SMVTS starts at 7.30 and ends at 3 p.m. Why switch from blended learning to hybrid learning? Pursuing hybrid learning is not considered a switch. What school materials are ordered per school for the year 2022-2023? And what materials will be ordered for public schools for the year 2023-2024? For all these questions relate to previously asked questions. Additionally, I would like to know per public school how much of these 2022 budget posts specifically for school materials were ordered, um, were actually ordered. School materials were ordered for 2022, Dutch materials for all public schools, which include Weilig Lezen, spelling in the lift, English materials for all public schools, handwriting methods and language tree, math manipulatives, for all public schools for the GOMAT method. And then for 2023, um, school materials were ordered, I think, all student workbooks from maths, English, Dutch will be ordered in 2023 or being ordered. For math, English, Dutch will be replenished. The school materials stock will be replenished because those was good enough for 2021 and 2022. We will also be focusing on handicraft material and manipulatives for the cycle one classes. Also the computers for SMVTS business school was ordered. All school materials budgeted were used up for exception of SMVTS. For the St. Martin Vocational Training School, can the minister give an indication, preferably 
as asked back in 2010, but as far back as 2010, but if not possible, as far back as 2017, which is five years ago, on how much money was spent by the government on giving some magnification <coughs> training school on official status. And Mr. Chairman, this, this question will be coming tonight on the morning. I have been told um, that has to be researched. How many students are currently attending the St. Martin Vocational Training School? Two, 202. And of these students, how many are at Rio? 92. And does the St. Martin Vocational Training School have a specification on students? Accio testing summary outlines the student's cognitive ability whereby their, intellect, their intelligent quotient is recorded. The school has students in the Accio stream with IQ scores ranging from 60 to 85. It entails the student's abil ability for testing, academic presentation, social emotional presentation, <coughs> overall results. The students transferring from Prince William Alexander School POAS are classified as special needs to be enrolled at Prince William Alexander School. A special, a psychologist and a psychological evaluation. So it's psychological evaluation is done and the student must qualify for special education services. Because of this prior knowledge, the school knows the student are special needs. Students coming from the general education population is deemed special needs. Are the students who are referred for AEO, AHEO, and qualify and qualified to be in that stream. Also, how many special needs students does St. Man Vocational Curriculum has? and do the students from the Prince William Alexander School automatically go to the St. Martin Vocational School and what provisions are made for them. Prince William Alexander students are not segregated from the other students enrolled, the other enrolled students deemed eligible for AHEO from mainstream schools. Data has shown that some students who come from POAS with higher IQ scores than their peers who are coming from mainstream schools. Therefore, all AHEO students from POAS and mainstream schools are treated equally. As I receive the various budgets, I have some questions. One for staff bureau. What is the staff bureau intention with the budget post 6021? 3476 with the amount of 102,000 gilders and 76 gilders. 102,476 gilders. Staff bureau intention for the budget account is to contract much needed legal expertise to deal with crucial advices and legislative matters within the ministry. As you know, legal expertise is scarce within government. And while contracting legal expertise, contracting legal expertise can be quite costly, not dozing can even be more costly. Therefore, the budget amount is very necessary and urgent for the ministry. The 2022 budget was amended and the account 434766021 was reduced from 162,448 to 92,068 guilders. And 2022 preliminary 11,634 has been booked thus far, as the finance department is currently busy with the compilation of the 2022 financial statement, the definitive amount cannot be given at this time. 
the 11,634 dollars and 72 cents has been spent on obtaining expert advice on structured operational procedures for the ministry and legal fees in an ongoing court case. Following question. As for the Department of Education, some questions as it regards to the school busing policy. What is the update on the school busing policy? The ministry has been busy for quite some time now revisiting this policy to a more cost effective one. What is the update on this and how much of the budget was actually used in 2022? Mr. Chairman, in November 2022, the draft agreements were vetted by both legal representatives of government and the School Bus Association. The agreement, which is currently on its way to the Council of Ministers for decision making, will go hand in hand with the implementation of the school bus management system scheduled to be operational for 2023-2024 academic year. Lastly, 3,600,000 gillers was budgeted in 2022 for the provision of school bus transportation and 3,519,707 gillers was spent. What is the department's intention with budget post 61010043476, which consists of 200,000 gillers? For legal and other expertise advice for 2023. And additionally, how much of this budget was actually used in 2022? And can the minister elucidate what activities these monies were spent on? Mr. Chairman, 200,000 gillers budgeted on budget post 6110-43476 is to be used for technical expertise to support one. The development of the implementation plan for the secondary education reform, the development of the implementation plan for special needs policy, research into the possible inclusion of insurance in the national decree on the funding model, it is geared towards providing legal technical expertise to facilitate the ratification of the national decree regulating funding for higher education on the study financing national decree and the study financing national decree. Facilitate the ratification of the drafting of the national decree establishing the standards for monitoring education quality in connection with the ordinance on education supervision address other legal matters related to education policy. And in 2022, this budget post was virtually depleted. The funds were used towards the drafting of key legislation, education legislation, and supporting the ratification process. The situational analysis for special needs, research to establish labor market needs, to establish the 2023-2026 study financing priority list research related secondary education reform, research for the development of an accreditation framework for higher education, review of the national decree on the funding of education and the calculation model, and research to inform the language policy. Question 10. Final question for the Department of Education. What are the planned activities for 2023? What are those activities, Mr. Chairman, for the budget post 61010-43489-60073 for the education reform? The activities planned for the budget post relate to the execution of the National Summer School Program. Mr. Chairman, for the Department of Youth, can the minister explain for the listening public exactly what the BOP program is and what it means for our students? How many students were catered for last year in the program? And how many students is the program expected to cater to this year? And does the department expect to see an increase in interested youngsters for the program of this year? Mr. Chairman, the answer.
The BUP program is a work experience program for the youth that will be celebrating 25 years now. The program offers training and job searching, preparing students with writing their resumes, conducting interviews, how to conduct themselves on the job floor, on the work floor, among other skills. In addition, this program allows students to gain access to the local job market. This has even provided graduates with employment. Students are monitored and evaluated on a biweekly basis by their supervisors to track their performance during the program. The students receive a recommendation letter for future jobs or for their schools based on said performance. So in 2022, the department increased the BUP program with 50,000 gillers via a budget amendment which was catered to placement of 90 students. Mr. Chairman, the following question. How many students in this program cater for on average pre-COVID and pre-EMA? The budget was formerly 100,000 and was cut several years ago to 75,000. Prior to Hurricane Irma and the COVID pandemic, the program accommodated up to 104 students with the participation of private sector, with the participation of the private sector. However, since most private organizations were challenged to pay the student stipend, participation by the private sector must be gradually rebuilt. But in the meantime, it is prudent for government to support this program, not only for the financial benefit of the student who receives, but mostly important importantly affording the student with the opportunity to gain experience access in the world of work. Following question, for the Division of Education Innovation, what acti activities are planned for 2023 under the Education on the Move budget? And what activities were carried out last year under the same budget post? How much of this budget was actually used in 2022? Mr. Chairman, through you to the Member of Parliament, Rumo. Presently, ongoing within the Division of Education Innovation is the project to review and update the FBE Social Studies text, textbooks and workbooks by a consultant. The implementation of recommendations from this review and printing of the addendum from this review for all primary schools, public and government subsidized, will be funded by education on the move budget from 2023. MP Remove, one of the important goals for me as minister is to see the improvement of numeracy and literacy among our students in public and government subsidized schools. Last year, the Ministry, through Foster Resilience Learning Project, in collaboration with NRPB, executed a pilot assessment for language and math using the early grade reading assessment and the early grade math assessment in nine selected groups. Group four, grade two, public and government subsidized schools. This project funded by NRPB and executed by the Division for Exams responsible for the assessment of and division for education innovation with coordination of this project via NRPB. The pilot was to test the assessment tools in our schools and make all necessary adjustments for the students on St. Martin. Just last week, the official learning assessment was executed in all grade three. The assessment results with recommendations for improving teaching, reading, and math in schools are scheduled to be finalized by mid-June. Once approved by me as minister, they will be shared with the stakeholders, school boards, managers. The training plan for the teachers based on the recommendations from the learning assessments project 
will be implemented by the Division for Education Innovation with funds from the Education on the Move budget. Mr. Chairman, maybe it's, it's necessary to explain that the assessment that we talk about here is a learning assessment, an international standard tool that is being applied in St. Martin for the first time. So what we have done is we have tested all grade one students, not group, which is group three, all across the island. And with the results, we will know if our students are on level, if they are above level, or if they are below level. And we will be able to ascertain at this moment um, what interventions we need to do at this early stage in their life. This is the first time in the history of St. Martin. So the question that was asked, if education is moving forward, I do hope that the answers are understood and it is the intention that it is an annual happening. So every year we will do the grade one students so we can catch them in the early stages and be able to help them with whatever we need to. What educational innovation is the division busy with for 2023 and how is this reflected in the 2023 budget of this division? MP Remove, the projects for 2023 for day are as follows. Completion of the review, implementation, recommendation of the FBE, social text and workbooks, execution of the training plan for group three, teachers as per recommendations from the learning assessments for reading and math in the primary school, training and development of materials for Dutch as foreign language in public and government subsidized school in collaboration with the Taal Uni in the Netherlands, Review of the learning material in the high schools on the history of St. Martin and compilation of existing and new materials for this subject area for the schools. Payment will come from Projecten van Derden and from Education on the Move project. Question 15 from the Member of Parliament, Angelique Rumou. For the Department of Sports, can the minister explain and, and outline what was done in the school year 2021-2022 with the school sports program? In 2022, two new swim instructors, male and female, were brought in to support the government swimming program. This yielded an increase in the passing rate and persons receiving a diploma. Through the funds made available to the NSI, sports as well as netball, track and field, football received funding for their school sports program, specifically for coach stipends, medals, trophies, and sports material. Question number 16 from Member of Parliament, Angelique Rumou. What are the activities planned for the upcoming school year for 2023-2024 with the school sports program? With the reduction in budget for this program, what does this mean for the program? And please outline what adjustments or cuts the program will happen as a result of this. And please outline what adjust, adjustment or cuts to the program will happen as a result of this. The desire was to continue with making the needed funds available for the school swim program, which will increase the number of children who receive free diplomas. The intention was also to support more organizations in the execution of their school programs by increasing what was already given to include volleyball, swimming, baseball, and basketball. 
With the cut to the amount available, we have made sacrifice elsewhere in order to cover the cost attached to the swim instructors, diplomas, pool rental, and material. Over 2022-2023, both government, swim program, and the school sports program coordinated by NSI would have impacted over 2,000 students through five sports. With the adjustments made, less organizations will be able to receive financial assistance for the execution of their sports program. Mr. Chairman, this brings me to the final question of the Member of Parliament, MP Bryson. Minister of ECYS, Education, Culture, and Sports, do the investments in public schools and other items and sports budgeted and elucidated and substantiated within the budget serve as the interest, serve the interest of the people of St. Martin? MP Bryson, yes. MP Bryson, Mr. Chairman, through you, I would like you to know that it is important for parents, it is important for parents to know that they should take the education of their children very serious. Educating your children is an investment that has no limit what the return will be. It is necessary that you take your time and make sure that your child is educated because it is better to have a well-educated child than a non-educated child. MP Bryson, the budget as I presented serves the interests of the people of St. Martin. Investment in the digitalization of education is long overdue, especially in public education, and much needed to educate future generations for the fast pace of inter and international changes and challenges. Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I await any clarification questions. Thank oh, you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I was just reminded that we still have two more questions from youth to answer. And one of those questions is from Member of Parliament, Duncan, MP Duncan, they care and the high cost. MP strongly believes that the early childhood education needs to be subsidized by government. There is a huge need to regulate the sector, in particular early childhood education. If the government were to subsidize early childhood education, it would ensure that the learning gap with lower income will be closed. In 2022, it proposed a proposal entitled Development of a Sustainable and Equitable Funding Model for Daycare Programs was presented after a request from the government to UNICEF Netherlands. Not only a funding model, but also a data management system would be developed in centers and after noon programs. Conclusion of the report are read by the MP. MP acknowledges that the care association is doing the best. Uh, this was done. Yeah, this was done. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I recognize the questions and I believe they were done. I thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answers in the round one. I see to my left if any members of parliament have any clarification. There's no need, I believe. If you have, you could raise your hand. I know the mics are off, but raise your hand if you have. There's no need. So with this, we come to the end of 
round one of questions from the members of parliament and all the ministers were present here answering all the questions from round one with the clarifications also. So I would like to adjourn the meeting until today later in the afternoon. The public meeting will continue at 11.30 at 12 afternoon and also a notification that there will be a central committee meeting at 11.30 for which the members of parliament will receive the convocation. So meeting adjourned and have a blessed rest of the night. <laughs>